The meeting of the Board of Regents of the Texas Tech University System is now called to order. Chancellor Mitchell, President Hawkins, President Johnston, President Skovenick, President Lang, and President Rice Spearman, will you please present your introductions and recognitions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a couple of recognitions and one update to give everybody. For starters, I would like to recognize Ms. Penny Harkey. Penny, would you stand up? Would you tell everybody your favorite color and your... <laughs> Penny, Penny uh, most of you know Penny. Penny Harkey is the Vice President, Chief Financial Officer at the Texas Tech Health Sciences Center. She has stepped up to fill in as the interim for uh, the Chief Financial Officer for the Texas Tech University System Administration. She brings 35 years of experience to this, to step into Gary Barnes' position as the interim. I've known Penny and worked with her since 2010. She actually began her duties at the system at the first part of April so that she'd have a month with Gary to overlap on things and uh, get brought up to speed on things that Gary was working on. I'll talk a little bit more about the search process later for the CFO, but suffice it to say that uh, we posted the position. It's been almost two weeks back, a week ago last Friday, and we've already had qualified applicants applying for the position. At the Health Sciences Center, Penny has served in numerous roles, uh, almost from the time after she finished at Texas Tech. She went and worked in private industry for a while before coming to the Health Sciences Center, but she's been here ever since. Uh, she's been an accountant, assistant vice president for budget prior to her current position as the chief financial officer. Anybody that's worked with Penny over the years can tell you that she's not just a wealth of knowledge about the finances of, of our system, but she's also, uh, she has a substantial amount of knowledge on the way the state works during the budgeting cycles and the like, which is fortunate for us given the fact that we're going into an LAR preparation time right now. She's going to do an outstanding job for us as interim vice chancellor, and uh, I'm extremely pleased to have her on board with us, at least temporarily. So if we can all give her a round of applause. Thanks, Penny. <laughs> the next person I would like to recognize is somebody that needs no recognition. Where's Martha? Where's Martha? Stand up, Martha. <laughs> all right, Martha Brown, <laughs> Vice Chancellor for State Relations. We recently, uh, as you guys know, we have celebrations every year recognizing people for five and 10 and 15 years of service and the like. Uh, Martha just hit a milestone, 40 years with Texas Tech and government relations. I don't mean this with hyperbole, but Martha really is a legend when it comes to government relations in Austin. Uh, she has done a remarkable job over the decades of helping to fight for all things related to our system. Uh, she has worked with a total of all five of the chancellors, 20 different presidents from the system, as well as six governors. So behind all the numbers, she's also the epitome of servant leadership. Martha, and in, during any given session, will be working on literally hundreds of different pieces of legislation as they float through the system. Uh, down in Austin and keep us apprised of all the things that we need to do. So please help me recognize Martha Brown for 40 years of service. Chancellor, can I say just a quick word? Martha and I were classmates at the Texas Tech Law School. And but for Martha, I would have failed constitutional law. <laughs> she, she is a dear friend. We called her the Brownfield Flash when she was in, uh, in law school. And uh, a wonderful lady, intelligent, smart, uh, understands the rhythm, probably the recognized expert in the state of Texas on how, how higher ed is financed. And so we have a real jewel here, and, and I've got a good friend, and I, I thank her for that. Thank you, Martha. Well, those of you know that how Martha works, that, you know, uh, I'm, not, I'm sure I'm not the first chancellor to do this. A lot of times we, you know, we're throwing spaghetti against the wall to see what sticks. And Martha's one that will say, well, you know, 
Now, back in the 2003 session, so-and-so tried that same thing and it didn't work out very well or whatever. So she's always been a very good barometer for everybody to know if you're just getting a little bit way, a little too far you know, outside your lane on what it is you should be working on. So thank you, Martha. Uh, the last thing I have is, a, is an update. Some of you know this, some of you may not, but we uh, have someone in the Rawls College that will perform an economic impact analysis for the various components of the system as well as our overall impact that we have as a system. This is what always, when we update these things, I call this my Chamber of Commerce information. This is actually great information, I believe, for all of the regents to really understand and to have in your back pocket all of the time. Because at the end of the day, when we talk about higher education from a state agency standpoint, what we're looking at is workforce development. And at the end of the day, when we're talking to chambers of commerce about partnering with us, when we're talking with economic development groups about partnering with us, this is the type of information that is really important to them. So each of the universities have the same information for their own university, and in fact, they have it for their various campuses, so that when you're out speaking to an economic development group or to a chamber of commerce, this is always kind of the lead in saying this is what our presence in your community does for you economically. And uh, the, the, there's, there are pretty complicated metrics that go into this, but the, to me, it's like anything else. Depending on the metrics you pick, you can get different numbers. But when you're comparing apples to apples to apples over time, using the same metrics as you, as you go, that's when you really get a feel for the impact that you're having. So currently, if you look at the data that comes from 2021, our total economic output as a, a, a system is about $16.4 billion per year. And if you look at that relative to other industries, this is outstanding. This is why you've heard every single chance we've ever had, every president that we've ever had talk about higher education being an economic driver for communities. This is a critical part of what we need to be reminding people of in the state of Texas. Um, because this truly, when you talk about funds that come to higher education, it really is an investment in the next generation's workforce. And the people that provide that economic development, the faculty and the staff and all the people that you bring on board, these are generally speaking um, high paying jobs that really add to the baseline, the bottom line uh, of the economics for a community. So if you compare this to the last uh, analysis that we did in 2012, We've had over a 64% 64, 64 increase in our economic output uh, from 2012, and at that time we were $9.6 billion economic output. We expect to see this continue to, uh, to go up, and probably the most important thing for the folks in Austin is to understand the return on the state dollars. We try out here at our system to be extraordinarily good stewards of the people's money of the state of Texas. So we try to be, and all of you have heard me say this before, we are used to doing more with less. And the return to the state of Texas for this is phenomenal. The return to the communities is phenomenal. And I'm extremely proud of, of the work that we're doing. So with that, I'm done with my recognitions, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Chancellor. Thank you. Uh, we would like to recognize one of, one of our very best, uh, Dr. Don Maxwell, uh, after a 51-year uh, career at Midwestern State University. Uh, because he had uh, the opportunity to work with Dr. Maxwell over the last part of his career, I would like for Dr. Camacho to do the recognition. He's out acquiring a little more information. <laughs> Sorry about that. Here he comes. He's a performer. He has to make yes, an entry. Right. <laughs> Apologize. I forgot my glasses. <laughs> this is a recent phenomenon, so that's why. <clears throat> so as part of faculty recruiting, I have heard many people saying to prospective faculty candidates at MSU, it's a great place to work because faculty here stays for a long time. And that's probably true, but it's not less true that MSU is a great place because Dr. Max will work at this institution for 51 years of his life. As a young student, 
Don was always interested in music, but he initially studied to be a, a medical doctor. He graduated from New York's Colgate University with a degree in zoology, and then fate intervened. One summer on his way home, he took a bus and made a stop in Wichita, Kansas. And Don decided to take a detour and visit a friend who lived there. He auditioned in French University for the show choir. He was given a scholarship on the spot. And then he decided that he no longer wanted to be a physician. <laughs> he moved to Wichita to complete a degree in music and to pursue a singing career. Initially, Dr. Maxwell intended to be a performer and not a voice teacher. <coughs> that was until a friend asked him if he would give a free lesson to one of his siblings. And during that lesson, Don had an epiphany. Teaching was his calling. Don's music studies took him to the University of Oklahoma, where he was awarded a master's degree and a doctorate in music education. He taught voice at Cameron University, and subsequently, we got lucky and accepted a position at Midwestern State University in 1971 as an assistant professor of music and chair of the department. His teaching technique is largely based on the teachings of Cornelius Reed, of which he's, a, he's an expert. He has graduated many, many generations <clears throat> of successful musicians that are now alumni of MSU. And it's not an exaggeration to say that in the field of teaching, voice teaching, Dr. Maxwell is a legend in Texas, just simply put that way. His legacy for MSU Texas, for the music students, music alumni, colleagues, and the community will always be celebrated and we celebrate now his 51 years of service and retirement. Good morning, Chairman Lewis and Regents. It's my honor today to recognize um, Dr. Test. And Dr. Test, so Dr. Test received a very rare recognition by the American Medical Association a few weeks ago, and it's something that's not bestowed on very many individuals, and it's the Medal of Valor to our critical care specialist, Dr. Victor Test, for his work on behalf of patients and the community during the COVID-19 pandemic. This reward recognizes physicians who demonstrate courage under extraordinary circumstances in non-wartime situations. Dr. Text was pivotal in helping us secure, develop, and distribute critical personal protection equipment to our faculty and fellows during COVID. In addition to securing this very much needed equipment, Dr. Test also built plexiglass and PVC chambers for the physicians and nursing staff caring for COVID patients. He set up a COVID-19 unit in the hospital's medical intensive care unit and developed all protocols for its use also taking on extra duties and shifts so other faculty could be home with their families. Dr. Tess also served as the principal investigator in a Mayo Clinic-led study of convalescent serum therapy in COVID-19 patients, and he helped with securing ventilators and other respiratory equipment for the state stockpile. Dr. Tess took call 24-7 for patients not only in the Lubbock area, but also the entire West Texas region. He personally called each hospital patient's family each evening with updates. Please join me in congratulating and honoring Dr. Tess for this recognition. At this time, I'd also like to share some great news that we have that we learned this last week from the Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center regarding our rankings in the U.S. News and World Report Best Graduate School Rankings. 17 of our academic programs ranked in the top 100, and 11 of those 17 ranked in the top 50. It is really a testament to the incredible work of our deans. As a president, I'm fortunate to have a collaborative group of deans who are focused on the mission and vision of our university. I would like to recognize Dr. Stephen Burke, Dr. Michael Evans, our outgoing dean, Dr. Quentin Smith, Dr. Dondra Seacrest, and Dr. Branch Snyder. They do tremendous work with our students. That's all I have today, Chairman. Thank you. Dr. Lang? Mr. Chairman and board, um, 
I have four introductions today. The first is Noelle Sloan, somebody we all know very well. She is our Chief Financial Officer and Senior Vice President of Administration Finance. She manages a $1.1 billion budget, uh, oversees financial and business services, auxiliary services, operations, safety, and security operations. You're probably wondering, what the heck do I do? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, Noelle came to Tech in, in 2006, where she and first served as a Chief Financial Officer uh, as Managing Director of Financial Services. Um, she has a bachelor's degree and a law degree, both from Baylor University. She's a member of the State Bar of Wisconsin and is a certified public accountant in both Wisconsin and Texas. Recently, uh, she was selected to serve on the board of directors for the National Association of College and University Business Services, NACUBO. This is one of several professional uh, obligations she feels, but I think it speaks to her recognition beyond this campus. And I think we all know that, Noelle, you do a tremendous job. <laughs> Next, I'd like to introduce Rob Stewart. Um, there's, there's so many things you could say about Rob, but I don't think on this campus, there's anybody who is more respected, not only for his breadth of knowledge, but the fact that he is one of the most kind and helpful people you'll ever meet. He has served as senior vice provost uh, for many, 11, uh, many years. He had been the associate dean in the College of Arts and Sciences. He was a professor in the Department of Communication. And he's been at Tech since 1984. Uh, he's published extensively. He is a co-author of three, three textbooks, including ones that's one of the most popular uh, at universities in public speaking. He earned his bachelor's degree from Lubbock Christi Christian University, a master's degree from Texas Tech, and his PhD from West Virginia University. So he has decided to step down from his role as senior vice provost and will be returning to the faculty. But Rob, I know we're still gonna call on you. And all I can say is thank you for the wonderful service you've provided the tech. You're deeply loved. <laughs> Next, I'd like to introduce Elisa Wong. Elisa is the interim dean for Honors College and a professor in the Department of History. I don't know that there's an award on this campus that she has not been the recipient of. She's a two-time Fulbright Award winner um, and uh, served in the Faculty Senate. She's a member of the Teaching Academy. But most recently, and the reason she's here today, is she was selected as the director of the American Academy in Rome, which is America's oldest overseas center for studies and research in the arts and humanities. She will be the 25th director of the academy and the first woman of color uh, in this role in 128 years. I'm on the text board live. Did I hear something? Yes, you did. The voice of God. Yeah. <laughs> it came straight from Rome. <laughs> but, uh, also, she is she will be only the third uh, director of the academy from a public institution. The prior two institutions that had a director were the University of California, Berkeley, and the University of Michigan. So tech is in very good company. It's a very competitive uh, process, and she will be serving a three-year term in, uh, in um, Italy, and we will miss you very much, Lisa. But we look forward to having you back in three years. <laughs> For my final introduction, I'm so pleased that we can recognize Gordon and Joyce Davis. Um, we've been so blessed this year with in incredible generosity. On this board, I want to recognize Regent Womble, uh, Regent Griffin, Regent Campbell for their very, very significant gifts. And Gordon has added to that when he made a historic gift of $44 million. And I'd like to begin with a little video we have prepared. I wanted to do this for the kids, the past, present, and future kids. 
The kids that Tech puts out in the College of Ag are the best there is. Well, I'm 76 years old and I've been in agriculture for 73 years. When I came to Texas Tech in 1980, somebody asked me, uh, what is your goal for your judge exam? I said, well, when other teams are coming to a major contest and then one of the kids in the band will ask, well, who do we have to beat? I wanted that coach to say, we have to beat Texas Tech. Well, there's no question, everybody knows that now. So I adopted that philosophy uh, somewhere in the 1970s, the pursuit of excellence, and I've never changed it. And everything I do is pursuit of excellence. My wife and I both, we voted two to zero on this College of Ag. I think agriculture is a sleeping giant. We're out here in West Texas, one of the great agriculture areas of the whole world. So why wouldn't we want to do this and get it better and better and better? And, and the sleeping giant gets realized and becomes one of the preeminent uh, colleges of ag sciences in the world. World War One. Because of the gift that Joyce and Gordon have made, we now have the, the Davis College. Um, I'm going to say a bit about both. Um, Gordon was a former member. He did not. He was not. He's not a graduate of Texas Tech. I think that's makes this gift even more significant. Um, and he founded the multimedia company ICEV. Um, his wife, Joyce, is a proud Texas Tech graduate in the Rawls College of Business. Um, I don't know if any of you were at the uh, Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo in the grand entrance. I was. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Joyce uh, was right there next to Ted. <laughs> Master horseman, <laughs> this person. You might take some lessons there, Ted. <laughs> but uh, what's most important is their love for the students. If you've ever been around um, the, the students in Kasner, especially those in the Meat Sciences program, they flock to Joyce and Gordon. He's, he's a mentor, he's a, they're parent figures to those students. And that's what they care most about is the students. So we say thank you very, very much. And Gordon, would you come forward and make a few comments? Well, you can blame the start of this on Mark Griffin. He told me to make sure I told the story in Joyce's own no. So I'm going to tell one. Uh, when I was three years old, I was in the backyard of Spokane, Washington. Uh, and I was screaming and yelling. And I was in the backyard. My brother got tired of it. He's five. And he picked me up and put me outside the fence. And I took off. And uh, the, my mother's yelling up and down the streets and all, where's Gordon, where's Gordon? Finally called the police department in Spokane and said, yeah, we got a little twerp down here. Uh, we found him in a, uh, in a busy intersection, standing around an intersection. And so we'll bring him home. So they brought him home and mom tells a story. There I was licking an ice cream cone with a big smile, uh, peed in my pants. <laughs> and uh, there I was. And the police said to my mom, you better get him on the farm because he's going to run away again. And so it wasn't long, we moved to a farm, a wheat farm in uh, Thornton, Washington. And uh, I got a chance to smell the soils, hear the tractors, feed the calves. And I've been hooked on agriculture for 73 years since. Uh, not only in Washington State, but also Tennessee and Texas Tech in various areas. And uh, I want to acknowledge this gift. We started talking to uh, Byron Kennedy and Lawrence Skubnik, uh, I don't think Lawrence had any idea. We started talking to Lawrence when we first met 18 months ago or so about football, my favorite subject. And uh, so we started visiting about all that. I don't th think he had any idea that 
that we might think about doing something like this. And, and so, uh, so anyway, in all the visits, uh, we, we've kind of just thinking about what we're going to do about the gift. Found out what the company was worth. I don't like paying taxes. And so we went ahead and started thinking about a big gift and so where it was going to be. And I had about five choices. And you can probably guess what some of them were. And so, but I just like, I really like Lawrence and Byron. And, and I like Christina Butts and her sidekick uh, uh, back there, uh, 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 Micah. And we just got her visiting more and more and more. And I just won't make a deal with anybody or give anything to anybody unless I like them. And I really like Lawrence. I hope you guys give him a raise. Uh, I, hope, <laughs> I, I hope you guys keep him. This guy I'll loves he's that a, gift a little bit, and we'll, we can. Like <laughs> yeah, he's a math guy, and I love math. Always did. And but we just got along from the first day, and and so finally we, we finally made a deal about uh, Novemberish or so, and I went home and I had talked to Joyce. I said, "Okay, Joyce, here's the deal." Uh, what do you think? Because we had to have two votes. And uh, she loves tech. If you ever been to a tech football game and watched Joyce during the game, and she turned down, uh, we turned down a chance to be in the uh, president's suite to watch a football game. Oh, no, we got to be on the 22-yard line sitting right there. And so anyway, she loves tech, always has. And her son graduated from tech, and, and I'm sure her grandson will go here, and he's certainly not going to go to UT. <laughs> and so, so anyway, uh, we, we went ahead and enjoyed the, uh, she voted yes. And so it was two to zero, and then we made the detail, all the details. And along the way, I've got to meet uh, Dr. Wong, the Dr. Wong, <laughs> and others, uh, the, the, and the alumni. We've been asked to give a talk here and there, and, and golly, the, the reach out from the community has been about five more, fivefold more than I even thought. But I thought, uh, I also want to make a comment. I want to commend you, you folks, you leaders, on the momentum of Texas Tech University right now. Uh, you got the dental school, Midwestern State School, you got the vet school opened. And I really wasn't a proponent of the vet school. Nobody asked me. But uh, <laughs> that was like eight years ago. And I'll tell you why. Because I had two different universities that I knew quite a bit about that started a vet school, and then the College of Agriculture crashed because all the money went to the vet school. And, and so I was uh, concerned about that because vet medicine, animal health, is a part of agriculture, probably somewhere between 10 and 25 percent of it. But the big picture is still it's agriculture. And so uh, then I went up to the uh, uh, Christina uh, wanted me to go up there, and I showed up uh, to at the ribbon cutting for the vet school, and I was very impressed. So I'm hard to impress. But the, the building, the 250,000 square feet you have up there, uh, the atrium area, the whole building, the enthusiasm, and so forth, uh, sold me over. And so I commend you guys for doing that. And I'm sure there are other people, including people on the Board of Regents in the past, that were not in favor of the best school. But I think it's a positive <coughs> step forward. So I changed my mind on that, and I'll switch that pair. Um, then. Then other momentum, I think the hiring of Mark Griffin and, and Coach McGuire, I want to commend those of you that have had something to do with that. What a couple of great hires. Because, you know, we failed that job in the past more than <laughs> once. And I think we've really, uh, Joy, uh, we were smoking cigars and drinking whiskey out in my patio uh, last Sunday night until about 11 o'clock. And all we talked about football, 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 not necessarily in that order. <laughs> and... And he told me about what his uh, brand is. He says, uh, our brand, and all the boys and the coaches have to hit the floor, do, do 15 uh, push-ups or whatever, or probably 50, I could do zero. But anyway, if they can't come up with a brand, the brand is the toughest, uh, hardest working, most competitive football team in the nation. So I got thinking about that. So what should the brand be for the Davis College? And I came up with, uh, so far, and a new dean when they come in, and maybe others will have to uh, chime in on this one, but I came up with excellence, passionate, most competitive college of agriculture in the United States. I think that fits ag. 
And when I say competitive, it's not only competitive with all the teams, it's competitive for research grants. Because I'm tired of us uh, hearing about we're going for a five or $10 million research grant and we come in second. I don't like second. It's the first loser. Some people call it the reserve grand champion and I say no. And when they ask me about the, uh, of our auditoria or, or, or of our, um, uh, of our uh, livestock arena, what about putting reserve grand champion teams up there? And I says no, that's the first loser. I want to be first. I'm not interested in being second. And that includes for research and judging teams. And the meat judging team is pretty good. The ranch horse team is good. But we have some other teams that aren't as good. Well, guess what? The bar is going to get raised. I expect them to, to do really well in all these competitions. And we're going to need more facilities. And, of course, I've talked to five of the departments uh, over the last couple, three months. And you can see a lot of dedication, loyalty, and passion in the college. But they need more facilities. And they, they're getting hurt on recruiting because Kansas State, Oklahoma State, A&M, and so forth, uh, they used to have better facilities. And we need to improve on that. And you never get too many players. Uh, I want to talk about West Texas region. Uh, no region is like this for agriculture. You're talking about uh, cotton. You're, you're talking about the ranching and ranches. You're talking about the cattle feeding and meat processing industry. You're talking about uh, wheat, corn, milo, grapes, peanuts, and then animal health and dairy. These are 10 areas. And you talk about economic impact. Who knows what the economic impact is if you add those 10 together alone? And the reason I mentioned uh, animal health is you got, you got horses, cattle, and, and uh, dairy cattle to take care of, and we're going to have to be producing vets to do that. But we, we need improvement in all these areas. I, want to, I hope that Davis College helps in the momentum we talked about earlier. And this university just keeps going straight up. And I'd like one day, and I had a visit with the governor for about 45 minutes about a month ago. And at the end of the visit, I said to him, uh, I think there's room in the state of Texas for two world-class universities for agriculture. We already have one. All you have to do is ask them, and they'll tell you. And they are. But they are. They're number two in research. Uh, we're number 38. And I'd like to see us get to 25. And, and by 2025, I'd like to get us to the top 10 by 2030 and get up there in that top five in 2035. It's going to take a lot of work to do that. But I think because of our region, no other region can boast those 10 areas that I mentioned. There's not one region, agriculture region in the country that's located that has a university like us sitting amongst those 10 big commodity groups. So there's no reason we can't. And the governor, I think, agreed uh, that, that Texas is big enough for two, maybe two more, maybe even more than two. But I think we're positioned to be the next one. And so uh, I think that's about all I've got. And uh, thank you so much uh, for giving us an opportunity. And Joyce, she hates stuff like this. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for being my partner. And thank you for the other vote, because if you didn't vote two to zero, no gift. That's where, <laughs> that's where the deal works. So thank you. Thank you, Gordon. Okay. Gordon, I appreciate the promotion, but I just noticed Coach Adams gone into the transfer. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, that concludes our introductions. Thank you. Well, Gordon George, I want to thank you for that gift, too. And, boy, if you think you like Lawrence, you need to get to know me, okay? <laughs> you know I mean. Okay. I just have, uh, I just have uh, one introduction, and it's, it's Guadalupe Valencia Skeen. So you know Lupe because we just recently hired her. You know about her accomplishments. Um, but uh, when Lawrence was going to brag on Noel for being one of the four board of directors of this national organization, he only talked about half of the Texas Tech contribution because she's on the board of directors as well. There are only four nationally. Two of them are here at Texas Tech. I said two things. One that talks about the quality of individuals we have. The bad side is if something goes wrong, you only have two other people to blame it on, okay? <laughs> but we're very proud of Lupe and her being a part of the system as we are Noel as well. So thank you, Lupe. Okay, any others? President Hawkins? Do you? 
Okay. So before we go on, um, Mr. Chairman, I've got, I do have one more person I'd like to recognize. He's sitting right here beside me. Dr. James Johnston, as, as many of you know, uh, Dr. Julianne Mazicek will officially begin in her role as the 12th president of Midwestern State University, Texas, later this month on May 23rd. I'd like to thank the interim president, Dr. James Johnston, for all the work that he's done. Uh, Dr. Johnston has served the university in several roles since he arrived there in 2003, including the dean of the Robert D. and Carol Gunn College of Health Sciences and Human Services, and most recently as the provost and vice president of academic affairs in 2017. In September of 21, following the retirement of President Suzanne Shipley, Dr. Johnston stepped into the interim president role at, uh, at the university, and he has done remarkably well in helping integrate the university into our system. I am personally thankful for his leadership, his collaboration, his input, and for the efforts that he has put into everything in, in, uh, in order to continue the university's very strong forward momentum during this time. As interim president, he helped guide the university through its initial values culture journey, where the university stakeholders came together to establish their own shared values. He also helped to kick off MSU Texas, the centennial celebration and he's been vital in our transition into the system. James, thank you for your leadership and everything that you've done for MSU Texas and for our system. That's it, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you, Chancellor. Next, we'll hear from our student government presidents. Trevor Bills, please present the SGA report for Angelo State. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Regents. So our uh, most recent event uh, that we started off over the past couple months uh, was the Rammies. So every year we hold an award ceremony uh, to recognize all of the hard work of our students and the student organizations. Uh, and we gave out about 20 awards for a number of different categories to celebrate all of the wonderful things that they have done over the course of the past year. Then, during our annual Angelo State Earth Day celebration, our Health, Environment, and Sports Committee uh, ran a tote bag painting uh, station during the ce celebration. Uh, a number of things were given away by various organizations at our university. Uh, and we like to give away these nice tote bags so that people can use them uh, instead of using plastic bags that are harmful to the environment. We also swore in our new uh, executive officers as well as all of our new senators who were recently elected and uh, gaveled in the 94th session. And then our last event uh, of the year was our banquet uh, where we celebrated our senators and their accomplishments over the course of the year and everything that we were able to do for our university. Questions? Thank you. Next, Austin Strode, please present the SGA report for Midwestern State University. Well, this is gonna be a bit more difficult than I thought. I had a whole script planned so I wouldn't go over time, but it's being annoying. Real quick, I just want to say and tell a brief story about Dr. Johnson um, to show how just student focused he is. Uh, one of the times earlier this semester, um, Wichita Falls got uh, snowed in, and uh, we were supposed to have a meeting with Dr. Johnson. And instead of, you know, taking the day off and relaxing like pretty much everyone else did at the university, uh, Dr. Johnson took the time to meet with my advisors and my exec board and to just kind of stay up to date with what was going on in student government. And uh, I can't condemn him, sorry, not condemn, geez. Um, but praise him enough on just how student focused he's been and getting to see that firsthand. So thank you, Dr. Johnson. So jumping right into my report, um, we have two major bills that were written by our past student senate and passed by our student senate. The first one was a video surveillance cam, the camera system bill which I got to personally write. While I was running for president and while I served in my term, I had numerous students coming to me and expressing how they felt after their on-campus apartments and dorms were broken into. And to me, that's just not acceptable to have that on our campus. And so with this bill, 
the Student Senate looks to uh, improve campus safety and security at MSU. The second bill that we wrote for is one that we wrote for our joint Senate session. It was written by our President-elect Gabby Pettyjohn and looks at a livable wage for our student workers within the tech system. While on the topic of joint Senate, the three bills that were presented were the student equity bill, the student mental health bill, and the food pantry bill. I am pleased to say that all three of these bills were passed and uh, it was an amazing experience to work with the student leaders across the system. Finally, as I wrap up my report, I wanted to give everyone a look into the next executive team for our student government. You see their pictures up there at the top right? I've had the pleasure of working with them on my cabinet this year and I can't wait to see the great things that they will accomplish. I also wanted to show some pictures from our banquet that we had to celebrate this past year. This was a very fun, emotional, and difficult night. It was fun because we got to spend time recapping all the work that we put into this past year. It was definitely emotional because this was the last time we were ever gonna be gathered there in our respective roles. For me in particular, it was difficult. I said that night that I had been able to work with a fantastic administration and system. That's true at all levels, from the students in our student senate to the board here today. Y'all have made this past year memorable and special to me, and it makes it difficult to leave. From meeting with our student regent, Keegan, to helping me understand how the tech system works, to working with Regent Griffin on the search committee. So for my final remarks to the board, I'd like to say thank you to the entire board for an amazing year. Thank you. Thank you, Austin. Much appreciated. With that, please, Austin Phillips, please present the SGA report for Texas Tech University. All right. Thank you, Chairman, um, and thank you to the rest of the Board of Regents for allowing me to, to stand up in front of you today and, and speak. Uh, my name is Austin Phillips, and I have the, the pleasure of serving as the 98th Student Body President of Texas Tech University. Um, so going into, into this, I'll just kind of briefly introduce our team and, and hit on a couple of our initiatives before opening it up for questions. So like I said, my name's Austin Phillips. Uh, I'm a junior from Lubbock, Texas, pursuing a, a degree in finance through the uh, Accelerated Bachelor's to Master's program. Uh, to my right, that's Andrew Ibrahim. He serves as our external vice president. Um, Andrew's also from Lubbock, Texas. I'm um, a cell and molecular biology um, student, um, so he studies a lot harder than I do. Um, <laughs> going a little bit farther to our right, that's Aaliyah Afote. Um, Aaliyah is a junior from the Houston area, an honor sciences and humanities major. Um, and she serves as the president of our student senate. Um, and uh, lastly, that is Jeremiah Neal. Jeremiah Neal is from Jacksonville, Texas, and will actually graduate this next week with a degree in agricultural communications. Um, and in the fall, we'll start his, uh, his master's in agricultural leadership. Um, I'm so excited to work alongside each of these individuals, um, as well as the rest of our SGA body. Um, each of them are extremely intelligent and well accomplished in their own right. Uh, and they bring unique backgrounds and perspectives um, that I think will be really beneficial going into this year. Uh, so now I'd like to briefly run through some of our team's core initiatives going into our term. Uh, these were built based on interactions and conversations that we had with Texas Tech students, um, kind of highlighting on some of the recurring issues that were brought to our attention. Um, in respect for your time, I won't go through all of the sub points uh, beneath each of these, these topics, um, but if you'd like any more detail, I'd love to go into them um, afterwards or, or into, into the future. Um, so the number, I'll just go left to right. Um, our first one is academics, affordability, and accountability. Uh, number two is health, safety, and wellness, student life and student engagement, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and then infrastructure and sustainability. Um, again, if you'd like any additional information about these, I'd be happy to share today or, or any time into the future. Um, so just a little about me. Uh, growing up, my entire family was Red Raiders. I, I can truly say that I've been a Red Raider for my entire life. Uh, Texas Tech has had an immense impact on me and the people around me. Um, it has done more um, for me than I can ever explain. Um, I've seen personally the positive impact that this university and this community can have on its students, um, and especially in the university centennial year. I look forward to striving to honor our past while continuing to look forward to its future. Um, we want to advocate for and ensure that every student has the opportunities and resources available to them to make the most out of their Red Raider experience, as so many of them before have. 
Um, I'm thankful for the commitment that this board and the Texas Tech system has had and continues to have in providing these opportunities and resources for the students within our Texas Tech system. Um, and I'd like to thank you for, for your time and allowing me to speak in front of you today. And uh, with that, I'd open up for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Austin. Brianna Mendoza, please present your SGA report for the Health Science Center. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and good morning, everyone. My name is Brianna Mendoza, and I'm the new SGA president for the TTU HSC. Um, I would also like to thank the board for having us here today. I am a Red Raider through and through, so it is such an honor to be in a room full of people who all work together to make the TTU uh, system such an amazing place for students to learn in and thrive. So thank you. Um, today, I will be giving all of you a brief recap of our year in SGA, and then I will be introducing you all to our new executive officer team. So to start off with, we will be making some changes to our Senate representation in order to uh, make sure that we have equitable representation throughout all of our programs based on the number of enrollment in each one. Um, you can see the changes highlighted in red. And of note, we're very excited to add a Senate seat to our new School of Population and Public Health. This past year, we were also able to pass 27 pieces of legislation. Um, some uh, to note were um, passing a piece of legislation to increase handicap parking in some of the parking lots of the TTU HSC that previously did not have any, as well as adding uh, handicap switches to some of the doors and entrances of some of the buildings across uh, several of our regional campuses. And we also passed some congratulatory pieces of legislation. One to note was actually to someone who was previously here earlier, to Dr. Victor Test. Um, our operational committee further advocated for student safety and access to campus buildings. And a major component of this was um, increasing handicap accessibility for our students across all of our TTUHSC regional campuses. Our scholarship committee awarded a total of 122 scholarships with awards ranging from $100 to $1,500 each. And our public relations committee increased our SGA presence on social media platforms um, so that we could keep all of our students updated on all of the legislations that we're passing. And then our community service committee created a Google Drive with folders for all of our regional campuses. And we wanted to provide students with thorough information on um, places they could volunteer at at every regional campus. And we just wanted to facilitate the volunteering process for not just our senators, but all of our TTU HSE students. Our social committee planned our first in-person banquet since the pandemic. There, they also awarded uh, 45 Outstanding Faculty of the Year awards. Also, SGA provided over $82,000 in funding for student organizations and special projects. And this is all thanks to the leadership of our former executive team. Um, you all know Bernardo. He was just here last year in my position. And with that being said, um, I would like to introduce the new SGA officers for this upcoming year. Our new Vice President of Communications is Miguel McQueen. He is a second year in our Doctor of Audiology program. Uh, this is Alex Sutter. She is our new Vice President of Operations. She is currently a second year medical student. This is Joel Ennen, our new Vice President of Finance. He is actually one of my classmates, um, a current first year medical student. And then that's me. I'm a first year medical student as well. Um, and we will actually meet later on in the next couple of months to uh, come up with uh, what initiatives we want to work on together to um, benefit all of our peers and so we'll meet in the future but one thing that we will be keeping in mind as our main focus is as you all know we are spread across many different regional campuses so one of our main focuses will always be to create equal opportunities for all of our students across all of the campuses and that is the end of my presentation i will now open the floor to any questions or comments that you might have Okay, Brianna, I have to ask. I've heard people say that I enjoy cooking as a hobby. 
but cooking with bell peppers. Why? <laughs> I need to know. Um, they're such a versatile dish, or, and so they come in all these different colors, and you can add them to literally any dish. My favorite thing to cook them with is eggplant. Okay. So that's right. my tip. <laughs> Thank you. Georgia Blackwell, please present your SGA report for TTU HSC El Paso. So hi everyone, <clears throat> I'm Georgia Blackwell. I am currently a D1 a first year dental student at Texas Tech El Paso. So I'll get started. So this is my report. <laughs> so we elected a new executive council. That's me, Georgia Blackwell. I'm the president. I'm from Venus, Texas. I graduated from Oklahoma State University with a degree in agriculture, majoring in biochemistry and molecular biology. And then there's Seth Smith, a first year medical student, Victor Vasquez, a first, a first year graduate student, Emily Estes, a second year medical student, and then here's the rest of our executive council, Mary Miller, a second year graduate student, um, Toby, she is a second year medical student, and then Andre, who is a first year graduate student. And we just added the VP of Student Wellness, so we are really excited to see what Andre is bringing to the role and how we can improve the mental health and overall um, wellness of our students on campus. So we had match day 2022. Um, all 91 of our MS4 students matched, which is really exciting. 17 matched to residencies in El Paso, 15 matched back with Texas Tech El Paso. So we're really excited to get them coming back to us and growing in their careers and becoming the doctors that we all want them to be and to serve our community. And then we also um, participated in the Texas Tech El Paso Days of Service. It was about three days where our faculty and students were able to go out into the community. I went to the Ronald McDonald House with my friend Josh, and it was super fun. We also put on a, red, a Raider Aid food pantry drive, which is our food pantry on campus for all of our students. They can access it 24-7 with their ID. So we got some food for that. And then we're also opening a Dress for Success closet, which was started by Toby, one of our new executive leaders. And it's basically a professional outfit closet for all of our students to enjoy and to use. So when they go on interviews for residency or they have a big meeting, like with the Board of Regents coming up, they can go and dress for success. I have a uh, question on that last slide. Mm -hmm. How many times has that student been held back on the bottom left there? <laughs> I, that's one of our faculty. So we, <laughs> so we wanted to make sure all of our faculty could really enjoy. So they were able to t um, go during the work day on Thursday and Friday. So working really hard. <laughs> We also had National Doctor and Dentist Day um, for our new dental school and all of our new dentists to welcome them to El Paso, along with all of our doctors that have been serving us. It was March 6th and March 30th. We had t-shirts, breakfast, and um, we gave some of our students and professors a good photo op with some signs. We also had a field day. It was a great way for the entire campus to enjoy and relax a beautiful day together. We had food trucks, as you can see, in Jenga and tug of war. It was a lot of fun, and we're excited to do more projects like that with our new VP of Wellness. Um, in the future, we're going to have commencement, we're going to have our awards bank, we're going to give out scholarships and awards to our faculty and some of our registered student organizations. We're going to have midnight breakfast coming up soon. We're going to host a leadership conference in the fall. We're going to have Senate elections, and we're going to have one of our very first diversity weeks. So we're very excited. Thank you. Any questions? George, I just want to, first of all, you did a great job. I know the first time you do it is kind of nervous being in front of the board. But this is historic. You're the first dental student to ever present before the board. Oh. Like well, thank awesome. you guys for having me. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you to all of our SGA presidents for those reports and your service. All much appreciated. Before we move on to our committee meetings, I would like to note that this is Keegan Holt's last meeting as our student regent. Keegan has dutifully carried out the role a student regent over the past year and has served as a consistent voice in providing a student perspective on this board. Keegan will graduate from ASU in the coming week, but she will not be leaving us. She has been accepted into the TTUHSC's Doctor of Occupational Therapy program, and she will be studying right here in Lubbock, so she will still be amongst us. 
Keegan, we appreciate the service you've provided as well as as a student regent and wish you well on the rest of your journey. On a personal note, uh, you, in my opinion, have just been outstanding. Uh, simply said, your thought, intelligence, work ethic, et cetera, that's been applied to your role, you simply just got it right. And so thank you for that. Chancellor Mitchell and President Hawkins, would you like to say a few words? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One of the things, anybody that knows Keegan knows that she is uh, keenly observant of the other students. She's keenly observant of uh, other regents. And I think that for any kind of career in a field of healthcare, that is something that, that becomes exquisitely important. The father of medicine, William Moser, father of modern medicine, said there is no more difficult art to acquire than the art of observation, but it's, it's, it's critical. Keegan is, is highly observant of everybody. And to point this out, she uh, noticed that for years and years, wow. every time I come to a board meeting, I carry all my pencils and pens in a Ziploc bag. And apparently that bothered her. <laughs> and so uh, she gave me this. Apparently there's somebody named John Hart that is an important person in the fashion world. But she made sure that I commiserate with the title that I hold, that I had something better than a Ziploc bag to carry <laughs> my stuff in. For that, I will be forever thankful, even though I'm still not sure about who John Hart is. <laughs> uh, but that's the kind of person Keegan is. She picks up on things that other folks don't pick up on. And I think that's going to make her a phenomenal uh, healer and occupational therapist. We'll miss you, Keegan. Mr. Chairman, I also echo what the, uh, what the Chancellor has said. Uh, Keegan is all over uh, student affairs and, and the student government in all of the different universities. We appreciate how she has also represented Angelo State University. And we'll also tell you that it's not just in the area of academics, it's in the area of sports as well. Her being on the cheer team at Angelo State University and still being able to uphold her academic standards across the board. We too are going to miss her, especially at the baseball games. If there's anybody who can cheer and, and, and really get on the officials and the umpires, it is Keegan Holt. <laughs> so we, we appreciate you, Keegan. God bless. Thank you. Thank you. Keegan, would you like to say a few words? I'll do, I'll do this without trying to cry, but um, I just want to say thank you. That's the best I can give you. <laughs> I'm crying because it means, like Winnie the Pooh said, goodbyes are super hard when they mean a lot. Um, but this board's meant everything to me this year. It has truly been why I've had such a fantastic senior year. So much that President Rice Spearman is like, you're not going away. So I will be working with her in her office. Y'all will not be getting rid of me. But thank y'all for this opportunity to serve this great institution um, and the system. So. I wore waterproof mascara because I knew I would do this. Because goodbyes are so hard. But thank you all for teaching me so much this last year. It has been an adventure. <laughs> so thank you all for everything along the way. And I will not be going anywhere. Y'all are not getting rid of me. <laughs> so thank you. Well, thank you very much. The meeting of the Board of Regents will now recess. The meeting of the Board will reconvene today after adjournment of the last committee meeting. We will continue now with committee meetings. All Regents serve as voting members on every committee, and each committee has its own chair and vice chair. The student Regent serves as a member of the ACS committee and is mandated by state law as a non-voting member of the Board. Actions resulting on the items from each committee are final and do not require additional approval by the full board. We will begin the audit committee with the audit committee meeting. Regent Steinmetz serves as the chair and Regent Acosta serves as vice chair of that committee. Regent Steinmetz was unable to attend today's meeting, so Regent Acosta, would you please begin the audit committee meeting? Thank you, Chairman Lewis. Good morning, everyone. The audit committee is now called to order. 
and Mrs. Kim Turner will be ready to give her presentation to us. First, I would like to entertain a motion from the Regents for the approval of the minutes held on February the 21st, 24th, excuse me, 2022. Is there a motion? So moved. Second? Second. All of those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Mrs. Turner, please present item one. Thank you. I decided it was timely to talk about the fight against fraud this morning. The Association of Certified Fraud Examiners every two years issues a report to the nations on occupational fraud. This 2022 report, which just came out a few weeks ago, is the 12th edition of this, which is the world's largest global study on occupational fraud. The ACFE estimates that 5% of global revenues are lost to fraud. And by far the most common way that fraud comes to light is through tips. It's nearly three times, 42% of frauds were detected by tips in this study of this past two years. Three times as many uh, as the most common method, which is internal audit. More than half of tips come from employees, um, which is why we have a fraud prevention uh, uh, mechanism at, at our institutions. Organizations with hotlines detect fraud more quickly and have lower losses than organizations without hotlines. This is an excerpt from the report to the nations. And you see organizations with a hotline um, typically have a median loss of 100,000 versus double that if there's no fraud hotline. Some of the fraud prevention efforts that we have in place at Texas Tech University system Start with the Regents rules where we have both an ethics policy and a fraud policy. We have institutional policies and system regulations also that lay out expectations for anti-fraud measure, measures which include internal control expectations and the responsibility for establishing those. We have policies around conflicts of interest and conflicts of commitment and then other policies that touch on fraud as well. Our office started a fraud prevention class course, not a college course, but a training essentially for employees about probably 12 to 15 years ago. We offer this at all of our universities. Most recently we've offered this at Midwestern State and had really good reception of that. So we'll be going back to do more classes there as well. Um, the, all of the frauds in this two hour class, unfortunately are case studies of Texas Tech university system frauds, frauds at our institutions. We've also, our office has investigated over the past few years, two significant frauds involving student organization funds. These funds are technically not under the purview of the Texas Tech University system. They belong to a student group. Um, however, if we hadn't done these investigations, they would have had to hire a, C a CFE or a CPA to do that. In both cases, uh, the fraud, one fraud was perpetrated by a student officer and another fraud by a faculty advisor. And those were, I think, around 30,000 apiece. So these are not small numbers in these two organizations that we looked into. We've developed some materials for student organizations to explain why fraud is, uh, happens so easily in those. Really, it's because student officers turn over every year. and. The advisors may be very involved or they may not be very involved, but in a lot of cases, the bank account, whatever bank account they have, has one person who's ever looking at it. We also do data analytics, um, both inside of audits and, and uh, investigations that we work on. We also do data analytics on sort of an ad hoc basis, and often we're providing those results to management at the institutions for them to use in their, um, in their work. We ask fraud questions during audits. It may sound awkward, but um, it's part of what we do on every engagement. External auditors do this as well on financial statement audits and other kinds of work. And then we do have a hotline here at Texas Tech, as well as the state auditor's office, whose hotline has to be, um, has to appear on the main homepage of every state agency, including our institutions. The way that our hotline came about was, was really interesting. In the early 2000s, um, the US Congress passed some legislation called Sarbanes-Oxley legislation that I know some of you have heard of. Sarbanes-Oxley was passed as a result of the major corporate frauds that happened at Enron, 
WorldCom, uh, and, and others around the same time. There are, are a lot of requirements in Sarbanes-Oxley which apply to public companies. At that same time, higher education was adopting what we called the spirit of Sarbanes-Oxley. Um, in late 2004, the Board of Regents um, asked me to um, implement and administer an anonymous reporting hotline at the Texas Tech University system. So through a process that involved audit, representatives from audit, general counsel, human resources, the police department, the chief financial officer's office, the chief information officer's mm -hmm. office, um, EEO, compliance, and others, we issued an RFP and chose Ethics Point as our hotline provider. Ethics Point is a, is a company, it's a third party provider. So whenever people make a complaint through that it's, and they choose to remain anonymous, it's truly anonymous. This hotline was implemented in early 2005 and is available at all of our universities and system administration. This shows you briefly the process. A reporter who's generally an employee, not always, but generally an employee will, can make a complaint. They can either call a uh, toll-free number or they can get online and make it through a web-based system. They choose a category for their complaint out of a number that we have in there. That report then gets routed. All reports come to our office. They also go to whatever other office might investigate that if it's not us, depending on the category that the reporter chose. So for example, if there is a complaint that's human resource related, human resources ordinarily looks into those and so that report gets duly routed. For investigations, um, we coordinate as we need to, sometimes across several offices. We have one right now that several offices are working on and then, um, final resolution is reached and um, the hotline becomes a tool in that. General counsel tracks all of the cases for potential legal concerns as well. We have certain redirects. Whenever we implemented the hotline, we knew there were some things that were not ideally reported this way. So when a reporter goes to the hotline and they, um, they log in, the first thing they see are a list of the types of complaints that we don't want through the hotline. We include policies, offices, people, so they know how to report those kinds of issues. Those are listed here. They include student complaints and grievances, faculty and staff grievances, discrimination and harassment claims. Those are not um, always able to be fully investigated if a party is anonymous. Misconduct and research or scholarly activity, we have other processes for those to be reported. And then, of course, the hotline is not a 911 replacement. It is not for emergency situations. Still, if a reporter makes a complaint in one of these categories, um, we take it seriously. We, to the, to the extent that's appropriate, we investigate. Um, and then, and um, in 17 years of administering the hotline, we have only had a few instances where someone was abusing the hotline. This is, a, this is a summary from Ethics Point for hotline reports made through fiscals, fiscal years 2020, 2021, and thus far in 2022. We've received 238 reports during that time. You see the breakdown by university and system administration over on the left-hand side. When we implemented the hotline, we knew from our peers that had done this a little bit before us that we would receive a lot of human resources type complaints. That has been the case and we had human resources at the table as we implemented this. So they have processes in place in the various HR offices to deal with those. The next most common category are the fraud, abuse and financial concerns along with conflicts of interest. And then you see a myriad of other uh, categories, including data security, safety, billing compliance at our health sciences centers. 238 reports may sound like a lot over a not quite three year period, but when you consider that Texas Tech University system has about 21,000 employees across five institutions, and this is an almost three year time period, it really um, is not an extraordinarily high number of reports. There's some benefits of the hotline. Anonymous really means anonymous because of the third party vendors way that they um, take in reports. They don't collect IP information or phone numbers or anything that could circle back to a reporter. And then each reporter receives a key. And if they log back into the report using that key into their own report, we can ask questions of them 
while they remain anonymous and have conversations and chats with them. So it's a pretty powerful tool for some of the reports that may initially not include a lot of information. Using ethics point for all this time means that we do have a history of information. Sometimes we have, are able to identify some trends and issues, um, hot spots where there may uh, be issues that turn out to be a problem. So this is one of our best available, available tools in the fight against fraud um, at our institutions, which is a constant battle. That concludes my report. Are there any questions? Kim, I have a question on the summary that you just presented. Obviously, all of these TTUS hotline report types mm -hmm. are really, really critical. But given that this is National Safety Week, could you shed some light as to what types of safety concerns we have out there and do we feel that they get mm -hmm. remediated at a very, you know, pretty, pretty yeah, quickly? The, the safety issues that get reported, we haven't had very many of the reports in the safety category. Sometimes there are things like, I think my building or my office has, you know, air related issues. We've had that report before. Um, it could be sort of unsafe working conditions, things like that. And yes, those get um, sent to our safety officers at whichever university that gets reported at, and those do get dealt with. And are those brought to the attention of the presidents directly? Um, not usually. Um, our, our safety folks may be taking those to their president. I don't take those kinds of things to the president. If it was, if it were a huge, you know, someone's bringing, I don't know, bomb materials to class or something like that, that might rise to the level. But many of these are um, not ones that I think rise to the level where a president needs to put time and attention to it. They've got their people that handle that, and then they may come up through the line if but it if becomes needed, very it would, serious. It would yes, be if needed, perfect. yes, okay, definitely. Great. Any questions on Kim's report? Well, thank you again, Kim. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, this concludes the meeting of the Audit Committee. Thank you, Regent Acosta. Next, the Facilities Committee will now convene. Regent Womble serves as chair, and Regent Griffin serves as vice chair of that committee. Regent Womble, please begin the Facilities Committee meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Facilities Committee is called to order. I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the meeting held on February 24th, 2022. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All Aye. opposed? <clears throat> Carries. Mr. Breedlove, please begin with item number one. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Item number one is for the Ranching Heritage Center at Texas Tech University. And I do have Jim Brett Campbell, the executive director for the Ranching Heritage Center. Jim, back there, thank you. If we have any questions that I can't answer on, on their mission out there. This item is really about truing up the design professional's fees with the project scope that has been developed with the National Ranching Heritage Center. So we've had an increase in budget and some scope increase. So we're coming today to try to get, um, get that back in line. So again, here's where the project location is. It's just south of the existing Ranching Heritage Center. And I'm going to go through a little bit uh, just to kind of familiarize you with you um, because we haven't been up here much in the past because of COVID and all this thing got put on pause for a while. But this is the outdoor area. This is the exhibit space, about 20,000 square feet. You can kind of see the magnitude of it. You can see that red pickup there. So it's a pretty large area. Um, this is where the kids are going to learn about windmill basics, solar power, cattle needs, signs of wildlife, ecology, um, you can see there's a little water feature there so they can walk, uh, go and walk all through here and learn all about uh, ranching and the business of ranching. So interior, um, that's just a blow up of the space on the interior. And this is a closer up space of this. Now this is about uh, 4,290 total square feet in there. You can see again, a lot of interactive um, exhibits are in here. Um, you, the kids can learn again about prairie ecology, environmental effects, cattle basics, horses, cowboys, and the business of ranching as they go through, through the facility itself. This is kind of a few renderings uh, I want to show you. That's the amphitheater that we've got planned. Um, again, another view of that. And this is where some demonstrations can take place um, for the kids and talk a little bit about ranching and maybe bring horses or cattle out there. 
And this is kind of some interior space here. This is the ranch security headquarters on the left. And on the right is the ranching exhibits and the interactive exhibits. You can see there's a lot of touch screen. There's a lot of AVIT in this project uh, where they can touch and feel, dress a cowboy, um, look at all the gear that he uses, um, that he has to do his work with. So I just want to remind you again on Design Professional 2 stages, um, this is what we're working with right now with our designer. Design development, we're in the construction document phase. Right now, um, CA phases um, after we get started, probable cost and project schedule. Again, the National Ranching Heritage Center proposed to build a ranch life learning center dedicated to educate the public about the fundamentals of ranching, the business, science of ranching, ranch life, natural resource management, and it's all told by John Erickson's um, Hank the Cowdog. So you can also purchase Hank the Cowdog material in there too, but it's really got a, a, a great, great um, scope uh, to teach kids about ranching here in Texas. So this is kind of, you know, we, we started this project back in October of 18 and the board approved a four million dollar budget to start design. Again, we came back in May of 19 and it was 5.4 million. Um, we took a break because of COVID, um, actually put this project on hold for over a year and a half and now we started back up after the first of this year. So uh, we're starting back with design, and as we progress through the design phase, this is kind of where we've landed. Um, 2,597 square feet, um, that's renovate, add 1693, and then we also have the 20,000 outside, which is this part right here, and the breakout of what all that includes. So it's a very large outdoor space, um, lots of technology in it, and so we're, we're trying to move ahead with that and try to stay up with the cost. So the additional request is the 228116. Like I said, that's just a true up the design professional fees with where we are in design. Um, the, total, the total project budget right now is at $7 million, and which is shown right there. So the recommendation is to add the 228 for a total of 940678 and looking at a project budget of $7 million. Now, I'll tell you what I've showed you on the slides today won't get in that $7 million budget. But we're going to be working with Jim Brett, uh, the president, and Noel to, to look at, and also the, the board at the Ranching Heritage Center, too, about options that we can take out, um, different things that we can look at maybe in the exhibits to try to get that number down. But our, our contractor right now, his latest price went up in one year 16.7% for construction. So that's actually below the national average, but we're gonna work with the executive teams to make sure that we can get a budget we can live with and give them the scope of work that their board expects. So this is the recommendation, sir, and, the, and it's funded by the RFS, and the current total of expenditures includes previously board authorized expenditures of 712. And how many of those gifts are currently committed? Jim Brett? You want to come up here, Jim? You bet. He's the only guy with a hat, so you know it's him. Ranching and heritage presentation has to be. <laughs> Absolutely. It comes with the territory. Uh, yes, sir, we have $8.9 million um, actually committed um, because we set a goal of $10 million so that we would have uh, capacity to add to endowment as part of the total project so that we can fund the, the uh, Ranch Life Learning Center in perpetuity. Um, but so we have an $8.9 million commitment. I just checked. Uh, we have $2.5 million in the bank currently, um, and we'll be working uh, with uh, Noel's office uh, to commit financing. Thank you. Are there any other questions? I just have a couple, Dusty. Um, Billy, what do you think caused that escalation to on the design from $4 million to $1.4 million? Well, actually, on, on the AE services alone, uh, they've gone up, they're at 729000 just for the AE. Uh, the other parts of the professional services are hazmat, um, surveys, geotechs, uh, commissioning, other professional services. So there's a little bit more than just the AE fee on there. The AE fee sitting right now on the $7 million budget is about 10%. And um, what percentage are we at design? Are we almost done? Well, we're going to be done, I think, uh, 100% CDs are going to be done in a month. We plan on coming back in August um, for GMP, so we'll have a lot of internal conversations about what that budget's going to okay. be. Okay, got it. And then one last question. Who is the contractor on this project? Uh, Tynert. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Any other questions? 
Will I hear a motion to approve the item? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? All right, the motion carries. Mr. Breedlove, please present item number two. Item number two, Academic Science Building. We've been talking about this project um, quite a bit lately, trying to get it out of the ground. So today um, we're coming with the CMR's GMP to start digging. So again, the project site sits back um, to the west of the existing chemistry building. They're already working out there. You've already approved two bid packages that had to deal with the utilities in the steam and, and chill water lines. So again, the artist rendering, that's the east facade that's facing the old chemistry building. And the site plan there, you can see how it orientates itself. This is a stacking diagram we haven't showed you in the past, but this is kind of how it sits. Um, you've got a basement and three stories above ground. Um, it's kind of um, everything's in line like that for the design and the construction, mainly for the HVAC systems and the electrical systems. And I'm kind of going to run right quick through the basement or through the floor plans. This is the basement plan. This is the physics area, Regent Carrick Davis. You'll you're sticking I'm, the physicist in the basement that's where again? The, I know. That's where they wanted to be, I'm, I'm telling you. Um, I don't know. They like it in the dark down there. But it, it's, um, so, this, this is about, so this is the basement. Um, and this is about 17,000, well, it's about 31,000 square foot, gross square foot, um, that we're going to start digging on. So with your approval today, we'll start excavation next week. And we'll have about 1,300 truckloads of dirt leave this campus once we get going. It's going to take probably about a month to get that done. Um, but that's the basement. That's the physics area. First floor is geosciences. Second floor is chemistry and psychology. Third floor, biology and the research core. So the scope of services is, again, it's the 129,254 gross square foot facility. It's got the five departments in there that we just mentioned. Um, this facility includes active learning classrooms, teaching class labs, research space, office space, collaboration, support spaces, and then there's four shared research labs in the building. That's biosafety, uh, BSL-3, uh, histopathology, biosafety level 2, and human sampling in a clean room. The new east-facing uh, east facing courtyard, that's where the student collaboration space is. And like I said, you previously already approved two bid packages. Bid package one was in November of 2021. That was to relocate utilities and get utilities to the, to the new site. And bid package 1A was for the four pipe hydronic thermal utility system that we discussed in El Paso. So here's, here's uh, where we sit right now. We had a budget of 100 million. Um, the price came in at 112.5, which is 12.5% increase. Um, we had VE options associated with this, this project. We looked at um, changing some of the facade, shelling out space, looking at different materials, um, just kind of lopping off some of the other parts of the building. And in talking with the president and talking with Noel and their departments, um, they wanted to move forward with the full 112.5 uh, to have a complete building in the end when we finish. Again, this is 12.5% higher than what we were shooting for. Um, but I just want to tell you a few facts. The economists for the Associated build, Building and Contracting's, uh, Contractors uh, Organization, they said that input prices right now over the last year are up 24%. We're up 12 and a half. Engineering News record, the national uh, material prices went up in 2021, not 2020 and 2021, just 2021, 20%. And then the labor rate's up 3.8%. So we're a little bit better than the national metrics, um, but we're still 112.5 million. So the recommendation, one is to waive the board directed fees for landscape enhancement. You've seen by the site plan, we got a lot of enhancements already built into the project. Uh, waive the board directed fee for public art, accept the guaranteed maximum price uh, for the ASB, increase the budget by 97 million. For a total project budget of 112.5 million, report to the uh, THECB and amend the construction manager, manager at risk agreement. So total project budget will be funded through the revenue finance system, repaid with general, general revenue appropriations of 12.5 million, higher education funds, HEF, and gifts. Uh, total budget includes the previously board authorized expenditures of the 15.5 million. That's a recommendation, sir. Lawrence, can I ask you, is there a is there anything unique about the particular, I, it struck me the disciplines that are under this roof. Mm -hmm. Speak to that just a little bit. Was that intentional? Or, oh, yes. And what, what is the, what's the purpose? 
if you, if you were to take a tour of the laboratories and classrooms in biology, the science building and chemistry, you'd see that they're substandard. Uh, we have rooms in the science building that cannot be fitted for laboratory use just because of the old infrastructure of those buildings. So this is something we really, really need it. Um, and it is primarily about instruction for the students, laboratories and instruction. There's a mention of research, but that's secondary. Um, psychological sciences will also be over there because they've become more analytic over the years. But uh, I would just merely state that those are areas that have been in neglect for many years. And uh, with the, as I recall, we had a hundred million dollar budget and there was some legislative funding surrounding that. That was the 12.5. So that was the 12.5 that's coming. Right. To be, to be contributed into this. Okay. Yes, sir. And, and uh, Regent Griffin, uh, we've only begun to discuss uh, fundraising for this project. We think there are some opportunities there. Uh, and also, there's quite a bit of contingency in this budget, Billy. Yes, sir. And so, I don't know if you want to elaborate on that, but it may be significant, it may be somewhat less. Yes, sir. So, this was a, a different approach that our team took on this project. Regent Acosta can probably, she's probably seen this um, going on too. So, we, we have the normal contractor contingency built in and the owner contingency built in, but I built in a buyout contingency too for um, cost escalation. And so we're not finished with the drawings yet. We're at 50% CDs is when this price came in. So we're finishing up the drawings. We'll be finished the 1st of June. So as the contractor buys this out, we'll monitor where he is on his GMP line item by line item. And if it goes up or down and they can prove the reason why, we already have a little bit of an escalation contingency already built in. Um, that's to protect, you know, not only us as, as the owner, but it's also to keep this project moving and it's to, uh, to take a little bit of a risk out of the contractors because you've got a lot of subcontractors and a lot of general contractors that don't want to accept a risk of a $112 million project. So we're trying to build that in to, to give a little cushion that we'll monitor and audit ourselves as they, as they spend that. And Billy, could I ask you share with the board the planning process that went into this? It's probably the most extensive one we've ever done. Yes, sir. When you try to get five departments, um, the VPR and provost and the executive teams all together to come up with this project, it, it was a lot of work, a lot of meetings. Um, at one time, I think we had 70-something planning meetings going on for this project. Um, tight timeline because we wanted to get in and get in the market. Um, but a lot of planning has gone into this, and a lot of people have had great input. So we think we're spot on on scope. President Skibnick, can I ask one more question? With respect to the, where the, um, the existing footprint for the physics department, the chemistry department, when this building is complete, what, what is the vision for how the departments get split across the buildings? Or are, there, are you going to repurpose some older building? Um, yeah, that's a very important point. When this is finished, we need to go back into chemistry, but primarily biology, and um, upgrade those facilities. And we think it's going to be several million dollars, I would estimate. Noel, would you say we're talking $50 million? Yes, sir. So that's down the road. But I think in, when we get to that point, we'll have state-of-the-art facilities that our students really deserve. And in your plan... I've got a to, question. Go ahead. Uh, can I be heard? Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. Yes, sir. Uh, for Dr. Skuvenek, <clears throat> um, with the um, amount of money that we're spending here, from, uh, specifically one of the areas is geosciences, um, you, we've had conversations before um, about the relative weakness of our oil and gas geosciences. Mm -hmm. Is that something that might be addressed so that we could upgrade the quality of that in advance of uh, putting these facilities in place? Yeah, uh, Regent Walker, I don't know specifically what would be in this facility that addresses the very point you raise, but 
But I would point out, if, if you look at what we've done in Midland, Odessa in the last couple of years in terms of taking possession of those core samples, um, that reflects, I believe, a change in attitude about being more involved in the oil and gas industry than we've ever been in years past. But um, I don't know, Billy, if you would even know. I, there's a lot of detail in there, but I can't s state for certain that it addresses research that will be related to oil and gas, but I'll certainly look into it. Yeah, they have. They do, do you have think it's an area also that we could get funding for from the oil and gas industry? And, and again, <clears throat> that, that's not an area of strength for us in geosciences. That's true. Yes, sir, and on, on geosciences, I think um, that department's located in about five different locations on campus, so we're trying to consolidate them into one area or two areas. Um, but I can, you know, one of the things you talked about on the fundraising, President Skubanek, is that um, we're developing a plan right now that takes all of the floor plans that you saw and that we'll calculate the cost of that, that area. We'll give it to Patrick Kramer and Byron Kennedy for them to go out and do fundraising. So we already will know what the 50% rule will be for each space that's in there so they can go out and start fundraising too. So there'll, there'll be some opportunity for the geosciences to, to look at their partners. Uh, Regent Walker, what I will do, um, uh, I'll visit with the provost and the dean and we'll specifically address the point you just raised. Is there any commitment to that initiative? Um, I'm not, I just don't know right now. Okay, thank you. In the plan that you and Noel have for really paying for this project, how much of that are you planning on coming from gifts? And, and of that percentage, how much do we have currently committed or um, mm -hmm. visibility to, to get to garner? Uh, right now, um, since we don't have gifts in hand, uh, it would be funded through HEAF. Noel, would you go ahead and address that? I mean, we can deal with that, but we'd like, but we certainly hope to raise money, and I think we will. Yeah, we have not um, done a, a large HEAF commitment for an academic ENG building in a number of years, so we have the, the debt capacity, and so we had already talked about um, doing 10% uh, HEAF cash down and then revenue financing system to be repaid with HEAF up to the 100 million. Then we were fortunate in the last legislative session to receive the 12.5 for this academic science building. Um, we do think there are great opportunities. Um, we have a, a different style classroom going in um, to this facility that is very technology driven, a, a student um, learning flipped classroom and we think a lot of those labs and classrooms are going to be um, opportunities for um, industry corporate um, fundraising so that we hope that we can offset um, a portion of the HEAF commitment with gifts as we get out and market the, the facility. Is it purely a coincidence that the budget went from 100 million to 112 million when we get the general revenue appropriation <laughs> yes. of 12 and 12 It is million. purely a coincidence. So, <laughs> right, Billy? Yes, sir. Purely a coincidence. <laughs> um, so we, you know, we, we had the opportunity to look at VE options um, to stay within the 100 million or to use that 12.5 million to increase the budget. And I think because of the significance of what we need to do to really bring classrooms and teaching labs up to the quality that we need for our students, and particularly in these science areas, uh, we felt that it was better to not shell space and really increase the budget so that we could get the building that we need on, on our campus. And it's possible the cost could be reduced if when we look in at equipment, if we can retain the institutional enhancement we received this year going into the future, we could pick up some of that equipment through IE money. Yes, you're right. How many students do we have in the, the programs represented uh, in this building? Okay, and, and biology, I think there's around 1,300 or so. Um, Geosciences, probably three or four. Chemistry, 900, 800. Uh, psychology, I think, is around 1,000. Um, Arts and Sciences has 11, 12,000 students, the largest college at the university. And um, they account for more than 90% of our external funding. 
and I think well over about half of those students are in the STEM areas. Any other discussion? Do I hear a motion to approve uh, the budget change as presented? So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Uh, aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Mr. Breedlow and Mrs. Sloan, please present item number three. So the, the past discussion we had um, lends itself right into the uh, next agenda item, which is to approve an exception to the Regents' rules and the total project budget for the biology building renovation. So as we talk about the academic science building and those that are going to be relocated um, concurrently, uh, we're going to be using some of the additional funding we got to be renovating the existing building. And here's some of the uh, pictures. Um, again, I think a walkthrough shows in much more detail the current facilities. So the top two are one of the largest lecture halls that we have in the biology building. It has been used for number of years without substantial renovations. Um, it is dark, it is not easily accessible um, by those in, with ADA needs. Um, the chairs are very worn and it's just a very difficult um, configuration. Um, and then you have like on the top right hand side just some very basic classrooms. On the bottom some of the, our existing labs. Um, these are some of the nicer pictures that we showed you. Um, <laughs> there are some in, in a little rougher um, condition um, where we have um, electrical safety issues as we bring in power and things like that. Um, so the reason that um, Billy asked me to present this is that we're asking for the operations division to uh, be the one to manage these projects because the buildings will remain occupied um, during the time we are using the funding to come in and renovate. So we're going to need a high degree of coordination between the building occupants, the registrar's office and where we schedule classes, our project teams, and many other campus partners that we do job order contracts with to come in and really ensure the minimal disruptions to our teaching and research environments while we continue to update these. Um, we're taking this opportunity to kind of showcase as well. Um, you may recall that the president has dedicated HEAF funding over the past five years in what's called the presidential forum. We've been four million a year. And so we have done some of these and we have renovated 27 classrooms, 16 class labs, and 45 technology projects. And here's some of those examples. Biology 106, you can see on the before picture and the after picture where we come in with technology, uh, whiteboards, um, more accessible chairs um, on the first row as well. Um, and the interesting thing is when we come in and renovate these classrooms as part of the uh, presidential Raider rooms, we've made a central commitment that we will continue to update the technology every four years in these rooms so it does not go out of date. And for our faculty members, they can go to any Raider room across campus that we've renovated now, and they have the same technology set up. So they're not trying to learn a different system based on different rooms. Um, here's a smaller classroom. You can see still had the green chalkboards um, that we have updated the lighting, the seating, and um, this IT screen technology. And then our teaching labs, um, again, the very old on the left. Um, and here in chemistry lab, um, this is uh, faculty and students love what we did with the lighting here to even bring in um, some unique aspects when we renovate. Um, you don't really see it along the right hand side, but you know, upgraded enclave areas that are much more safer than what we had in the past. So what we're um, asking for is, is that we would begin design right now and the construction would actually go over a three to four year period. Um, we would go, come into the building and replace all the plumbing, um, renovate the restrooms for ADA. Um, we would take a series approach again to minimize disruptions, to do the classroom and lab renovations by floor and the uh, large lecture hall room 100, converting that to a Raider room. 
The preliminary budget is the eight million three hundred and ninety nine thousand broken down there by plumbing, restrooms, ADA life safety. The biggest in, um, investments being in the classroom and class lab and the large lecture hall renovations. So the recommendation is to authorize this renovation project funded through the capital construction assistance project. So we're also using um, that funding that has come through to concurrently work on the renovations. Um, we're going to ask for the approving an exception to the Regents rules in order for the project to be managed by Texas Tech's operation division instead of um, FPNC. Waive the use of a construction manager agent. Waive the board directed fees for landscape and public art. We will continue to report the project at regular board meetings. We'll report the project to the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board and authorize the total project budget that you see there. This project is going to be funded through the revenue finance system, repaid with the funds appropriated to the institution by the legislator for capital construction assistance program debt service, including the initial debt payment appropriated by Senate Bill 8 of the 87th legislature. Uh, any questions? No, well, I think it's great that you're waiving the, the CM agent fees on this project. I think it's going to save some money on that. So you Thank go. you. No, well, who, so who is the ultimate, uh, who, who is the, the manager of this? I know we're using internal offices to do the construction. Who's, who is the manager they're going to oversee? Who's Sean Childers sitting in the here to help me with any technical questions. Yeah, Sean Childers and his team in the operations division will manage the, the overall project. Okay. And report to you. Yes, sir. Okay. Any other discussion? Do I hear a motion to approve as presented? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Uh, Mrs. Sloan, if you will present basically the same thing for the uh, experimental science building. Correct. It is the same thing, same use of uh, funding source, but this is for the experimental science building. Um, here again is pictures of the existing experimental science building that has not been renovated since um, it was built. Um, this one in particular, um, what we have here is a um, highly precise environmental requirements needed for research and the uh, system controls of the building are uh, failing. Um, it's, we actually have like about three different systems to maintain in, in this building. Um, some of those systems we can no longer um, obtain parts for. So this project, again, may take us a couple years to work through the entire building, but the project is going to be the replacement of the entire building's control system, supply and exhaust air valves, switch gear, along with require, required commissioning, testing, and balancing of the building equipment. Uh, one of the things that we discussed is um, where does this land overall for our campus? So we have 113 occupied buildings on the main campus. 78 of those are E&G, academic or research facilities. 79% um, of those buildings, we have already moved to a um, JCR or Contech controlled system so our operations division can see the controls and see when any of the valves um, are not operating when we have a leak somewhere how we can adjust temperature controls from our uh, central uh, physical plant so that leaves uh, 16 buildings that are not on that system yet uh, three are in progress two are in a planning stage this being one of those, if approved, which will leave 11 buildings or 14% of our campus still to be um, uh, switched over in over time as those systems fail or we get, um, um, we plan those out at the appropriate time. So right now we have three in progress, two in planning, and we are trying to get to where we are um, consistent control system throughout our campus academic and research buildings. Uh, so this one is a $4,350,000 budget, $4 million going to the um, building controls and $350,000 to replace the electrical switch gear. 
The same recommendation is made that we approve the exception in order for the operations division instead of FPNC to manage the project, waive the CMA, waive the landscape and public art uh, report to the board and to the coordinating board and authorize the total project budget of four million three hundred fifty thousand. Again, this is funded through the revenue finance system um, by the funding we received from the legislature later for the capital construction assistance program debt service including the initial debt payment appropriated by senate bill 8 in the last legislative session thank you noel any uh questions yes, Mark. I, noel is there any reason if, if we're gonna i'm assuming the jc something was johnson controls yes sir if we're intending to use them throughout the rest of the 11 buildings that are left, is there any merit to going ahead and contracting and staging or spacing this out over a period of time from a cost control standpoint, as opposed to waiting, or at least maybe I'm missing something. Well, just to be, I, I want to clarify, there's two systems that we're using, uh, Johnson Controls and Contech. Contech is a company that specializes a little bit more in some of the controlled research lab environments. Um, Johnson Controls, we do have a um, master agreement with, and we do, for the reasons you say, um, look for those cost savings by entering into the um, master agreement with them. Uh, Johnson Controls has been very beneficial in also providing um, their professional services in how we schedule this out how we um, update the buildings and where we can provide energy efficiencies. So to your point, yes, we have been doing that and we have been working with Johnson Controls um, over the past couple years for that and we will um, continue to do so for the remaining buildings. But they're not the only vendor, so there's another consideration. Yes. Okay. I have a follow-up to Mark. Just um, this is also going to be utilizing the job order contractors that we already have in place? Yes, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? I'll entertain a motion to approve as presented. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. I agree with Lawrence. Noel, I don't really know what he does. Mr. <laughs> 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 Breedlove, please present your construction projects report. Now, Mr. Chairman, I want to talk about two projects uh, this morning. One is the Rip Griffin Park expansion and renovation. Um, the top left picture is the new, going to be the new front door to the baseball program. And then you can see some spot footings on the bottom left and spread footings being poured, getting ready for um, getting all the foundation in. Um, this is going to, we're going to pour the slab on grade in about two weeks and then we'll have steel coming. So we should, by the end of May, be going vertical with structural steel. So the building will start taking shape um, pretty quickly. So this is the hydrotherapy pit. I wanted to show this. I thought it's kind of unique in construction. Um, this is going to have three tubs, and it's a hot and cold plunge. And you can see on the right the two little platforms that those will sit on. And it's got a hydrotherapy pit that will actually have a treadmill down in the bottom of it so the athletes can, can do underwater um, rehab also. So the one on the left is where they're tying all the rebar and putting all the structural in and then they poured the walls and the base on the right. We'll have another pour on that for the top slab uh, where the tubs will actually sit on that. It's about 10 feet deep probably um, but you're going to see that starting to take shape here pretty quick. We're ready to get vertical and put a roof on that so we don't catch a bunch of foul balls anymore. <laughs> So we have moved a little bit of money around there, um, 8,200 bucks. That's just for um, the city of Lubbock to put in a water meter. So we moved that between line items. Uh, the next project is the School of Health Professions Physician Assistant Building on the Midland College campus. Um, we've showed this um, a couple of times where we actually have reached substantial completion at the end of March. Um, in, the, in these photos, you got the collaborative classroom. That's the top left and the bottom right. And then you have the clinical classroom on the bottom left and top right. And I know um, Dr. Ross Spearman's been there many times. I see it posted on social media. She's been there a bunch. But the building is, is really taking um, great shape. It's beautiful. Um, on the left, is, it's just a break room, but I wanted to show how HSC is starting to do a lot of branding in their buildings um, to, to recognize Texas Tech and make those students feel like they're at Texas Tech. They're actually using the classrooms now uh, since we got substantial completion. 
And on the bottom right is your gross anatomy lab. Um, I wish I'd have had the, the picture of it, but now the table, the cadaver tables and tanks are now in place there. Um, that will, I think you can um, have up to 100 students in there. And yesterday, um, I'm not sure um, if you've heard, but okay, so you probably heard the state anatomical board inspected that space yesterday and it passed. So that's a big, big aha moment for us as we get through that. So the space has really taken um, a great, great shape on this. I wanted to show a little bit on this money. Um, the contractors demobilized. We've had some savings and efficiencies throughout this project, and we are utilizing those savings. HSC kind of had a priority list that they wanted to look at if we had savings in it. So we're actually um, replacing two boilers, an air, air handling unit on the roof. Um, we've ordered a fire pump. They've never had a fire pump there, and just recently they had a, um, a low pressure alarm go off in that part of the city, so we we're gonna try to up the pressure there. Um, and anyway, we also, we also renovated some other spaces there too. So we had some great savings. HSE had their priorities, and, and we're moving forward on that. The rest of that work, because of the lead time to get that equipment in, uh, the rest of that work will end about the end of August. So with substantial completion, we will have a ribbon cutting May 16th. Um, you'll be receiving invitations for that. This will wrap up phase one, which was a $30 million that came from the legislators. Uh, we received another $18 million, and so we're working on phase two right now, and we'll be coming forward with that. We're working closely with Midland College. The big part about this anatomy lab, it's the first in the region of this top in the Permian Basin. We're opening it up to other health professions groups in the city, such as Midland College, for them to do training. Our students will no longer have to get on Greyhound buses in the summer and come up to Lubbock for gross anatomy. So this is a big step for the physician assistant program in Midland. Dr. Ross Spearman, how many students are impacted by this? Right now on the Midland College campus, we have about 240 students. Any other questions regarding Billy's report? Mr. Chairman, I had one other item I wanted to touch base on, if, if I may. Um, I had a conversation with Chairman Lewis um, about what's in the back of your book uh, on the MP1s, and it's in, in the consent item under letter K. But I wanted just kind of um, as a reminder um, of why that's back there. It's, it's a consent item because it's just a, really a compliance item that we have to report on every year. But it's the institutions of higher education must submit to the THECB annual updates on the capital expenditure plan, the MP1s. It's uh, those reports based on the institution's five-year capital project plan, list all capital construction, major repair, renovation projects, real property acquisitions, major informational technology projects that may be accomplished in the next five years. And so this report is compiled by the component institutions, CFOs, facilities teams. They prioritize those reports. Um, we work with them some on their budgets, uh, and then they, put, they fill that report out. We put it in consent, and then we um, report it to the state um, July 1st, 2022. It's by no means uh, a request for um, construction or budget approval or anything. It's just for compliance and informational use only. Billy, what processes did you go through to establish the CapEx budget based on today's world that we're living in? On this, these budgets here? You know, we have, we talk with the facilities teams quite often, um, and of course, the, they watch the, the same news that I see, and then we look at the same kind of markets that, that they're looking at, and so we have communications about what we're seeing, and plus they're watching our projects too as we see what happened to the Academic Science Building or the Ranching Heritage Center. So I think they built the inflation costs into their, their own uh, projects. Thank you. Thank you for that, Billy. That's my report, Mr. Chairman, unless anybody's got any Thank other you, questions. Mr. Breedlove. Mr. Chairman, this concludes the meeting of the Facilities Committee. Thank you, Regent Womble. Next, the Finance and Investments Committee. Regent Walker serves as chair, and Regent Campbell serves as vice chair of that committee. Regent Walker will preside on Zoom, so please continue with the Finance and Investments Committee meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good job. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Finance and Investments Committee is called to order. Um, I, uh, uh, I think in my two terms, this is the first time I've missed a meeting, and I apologize. I, I got COVID at an oil and gas meeting. About 60 of us got COVID. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and I talked to uh, the chancellor and didn't feel like it was uh, a good idea for me to come. 
um, particularly with the Chancellor's fragile health. I didn't want to <laughs> um, possibly <laughs> infect him. Um, so uh, I'd like to uh, first entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the meeting held on February 24th, 2022. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Uh, Mrs. Harkey, please uh, present item one. Item number one is requesting the Board of Regents to approve um, the tuition and fee rates for fiscal year 2023 to be continued at the previously approved rates uh, until the time that the Board of Regents approves a modification to the tuition and fee schedule. Basically, the Board approved tuition and fees in uh, December of 2019, and that was only for fiscal year 2021 and 2022, and even to continue at the concurrent rates into fiscal year 2023, we need to be able to have the approval of those rates uh, from the Board of Regents. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? I have a, I have a question. I'm kind of interesting conversation I had with uh, Chancellor Mitchell the other day. Um, you know, we, we have very low rates of tuition and fees at Texas Tech, and uh, we're proud of that. But uh, what is the impact? So if, if we charge the same as Texas A&M and uh, their system and the UT system, just if you, if you put their rates on to TTU, what would be the impact and additional revenue to Texas Tech. What was the number you told me, Ted? It would be significant. Yeah. Well over $100 million, something like that, right? It'd be significant. Yeah. So just, I, I think it's just, I, I thought that was really interesting, you know, how much lower we are than the other large systems in the state and, you know, something to think about and consider as we move forward. It definitely is something we will consider as we move forward. Mm -hmm. um, Other um, questions? Are there are there any other questions? Um, is there a motion to approve the item as presented? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Um, Mrs. Sloan, uh, item two, please. Good morning. The second item is a request to approve a four-year contract with the City of Lubbock for bus service. Um, as you'll recall, the City of Lubbock and Texas Tech University partnered throughout the pandemic time period to modify and provide our campus community with city bus and transportation services through contract extensions with no cost increase. Today's agenda item is the new proposed city bus contract that will continue the longstanding agreement between the City of Lubbock and TTU to provide our students additional commuter options. It helps reduce our traffic congestion on campus, it reduces our infrastructure demands, and it provides transit between student population areas both on our campus and off campus. The contract as negotiated will provide bus services for four years beginning September 1st, 2022 and ending August 31st, 2026. We do have the right to terminate the contract with 30 days written notice. Um, we're currently at a rate of $61 per hour um, for our current extended many times contract. The new contract um, creates a, a large jump because of uh, no increases for a number of years, also takes into account the current uh, fuel costs, labor market, and things on city buses time. So it is $70 per hour for the first two years and $75 per hour for the final two years of the contract. We're currently paying about $4 million annually. This increase will increase it to a total of about $4.4 million annually for the first two years and 4.7 million for the second two years. The increase for the fiscal year 2023 can be funded through uh, utilizing our fuel reserves within the transportation fee account. So as you, as you know, we have a student transportation fee that is $13 per semester credit hour, capped at $52 per term, and there is no increase in that student rate to um, pay the contract for the first fiscal year 2023. 
So the President recommends when the Chancellor concurs that the Board of Regents authorize the President or his designee to finalize negotiations and enter into a four-year contract with the City of Lubbock to provide on and off campus bus service routes benefiting TTU students. Are there any questions that I can answer? It's not a question, Noel, more of a statement. I'll be, I'll be pleasantly surprised because of the fuel cost environment we're in right now and, the, and that percentage of operational cost as it relates to city bus if, if we're anywhere close to that number, <laughs> quite frankly. I hope we can do that, but it, I'll be shocked. If so hopefully good for us if we lock in at that right. Yes. Yeah, diesel cost is very high right now. Um, any other questions? Is there a motion to approve the item as presented? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Mrs. Sloan, please continue with item three. Yes, the next agenda item is that approving a contract with Salesforce for campus customer relationship management platform licenses. Uh, so they refer to it as a social enterprise license agreement. We actually have existing agreements with Salesforce, um, our undergraduate admissions, our graduate school, our athletics ticketing offices, but it's multiple contracts, different beginning, end dates, and we're now going to combine it into a master agreement, what they call social enterprise license agreement. We're gonna add new service areas specific to our student success and retention, which is currently using a different platform. Um, con by consolidating, we're gonna get a discount off market rate, and we're gonna lock in what we can add additional licenses for additional areas. We're gonna lock in the rate now um, to be able to add at that lower cost. Um, currently, we're spending $450,000 a year with uh, Salesforce for the areas that, six different areas that currently use it, plus an additional $320,000 for our student advising platform that is not, worth sales, not with Salesforce. Um, when we combine it into Salesforce, it's going to create this comprehensive student engagement platform that's going to manage the student's journey from the time they submit an application all the way till they graduate and beyond even for um, alumni. And it's not just going to say um, when, a, when a student advisor goes in what the student's major is or how they're doing in their classes, but also we're going to know everything that they're, they're, they're engaged in in their student life. Um, so it's going to be um, each area of student engagement can enter um, items in, and that platform is going to allow any the advisors to go in and know more personally about the student, help engage and create that um, mentor one-on-one -on -one relationship with the student, and help our students be successful and increase our retention with students. Um, the consolidation of these um, multiple license into one master agreement, uh, like I mentioned, allowed for us to negotiate discounts. Um, Salesforce tells us that the market rate for everything included in this package would be about $7.2 million. Um, and so we're getting it for the bargain cost of $1.5 million a year. <laughs> um, the, it, the contract is going to be effective June 1st if approved by the board today, and it's a, for a three-year term. It is an annual cost of the $1.5 million, um, but we will receive a credit of about $122,000 because of the existing contracts that we had already paid for. Um, there's also a one-time implementation fee, and this is $2.6 million, but it brings in a customer service architect. It's going to help us implement and um, migrate our data and provide that technical support. So even though we have an enterprise risk management system that shows all of their admissions and things like that, this takes the, all that data to another level and puts it on a platform um, and also provides us the ability to communicate directly, whether it's our students, faculty, and staff, in a much more um, robust manner, um, whether that be by email, text message, things like that, to engage with our, 
um, customers, our students, our faculty, and our staff. Um, Salesforce is also coming to the table and partnering with Texas Tech University Texas Tech University, um, by allowing us to teach Salesforce in the classroom. They're providing free Salesforce and Tableau software for our students and faculty to learn hands-on. Uh, they provide mentorship and career opportunities, internships, recruiting, and also um, have a lot in their platform with accessibility and disability inclusion. So the president recommends and the chancellor concurs that the Board of Regents authorize the president or his designee to finalize negotiations and execute a contract with Salesforce to provide campus customer support and relationship management software licenses. Are there any questions that I could answer with respect to this item? I have one. You, you just said the word alumni. You said that it, it takes the student from the time that we get them all the way through to alumni. How, how does a, alumni play into that? Right. We have not added that service platform yet um, but it's one of those things that again once you're all once it's all in this platform it's it'll be much easier to identify here's the subset of students that were um, involved in um, this student group here's the set of students that were involved um, and graduated with this degree um, and these are the set of students so that you have all that knowledge of the students history throughout Texas Tech and how to engage more directly once they're um, also graduated from TTU on the specifics for that student. Could you use that as a way to help? And I, I've mentioned this probably like two years ago. I can't remember, but because uh, I used to be on the board for the Alumni Association. And I always, it always bothered me. I wanted to be able to tie in alumni directly to students as they're looking for job opportunities when they're graduating. Mm -hmm. And so I know the Alumni Association has created this tech, Texan connection. And I, I just went in to see if I could sign up. But there's, there's, no, there's more alumni than students in there. And so if you have this app with the students, you know, how, how can you merge it all so that you can make these connections better? Yeah. I don't think we've thought about how to merge it with that specific service offered by the Texas Tech University Alumni Association. Um, it's two, there are two different, very plat, two, two very different platforms. Scholarship that would be part of the record. Right now, it's difficult to pull some of that information. But as it relates to employment. That's a very good point. But that's not something I'm aware that we have discussed. We have not. We've been looking currently at from time they enter till time they graduate, but that is something that we can look at once we get this platform in place. Um, but again, President makes a very good point, and I shouldn't, I, I mean, maybe alumni is the wrong word, but when we are doing fundraising, it's, you know, it'd be helpful to know, like, if we're fundraising for the academic science building, who are those that received presidential merit scholarships that graduated with a geosciences degree that may want to give back. Okay. Yeah, I, I think it would be great if we could, you know, consider and look at potentially expanding the CRM platform to help with alumni relations. Um, you kind of stole my question. Oh, sorry. It's all right. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, I mean, I, I think we can do a better job of that, and these kind of platforms are very powerful. And, um, you know, anyway, we'll see how it goes, but... I think it's something we should consider moving forward. And hire Red Raiders, too. So now that I'm in the private sector, I have to go out and hire my own people. So it's a weird thing, weird place to be. So I went on to hire Red Raiders. I talked to the Alumni Association. But you, know, you can put in there whether or not you are an alumni. And it'd be neat if you have these companies coming in and putting their stuff in hire Red Raiders. And it talks to the sales force. And you have a student interested in a career and, and it could if we figure it out it could be something we could model at all of the universities it, it operates somewhat informally now uh, I was at a banquet the other night with a group of students and I was asking what they were going to do almost to a person they said well the Red Raider network helped me get my job and I don't know exactly how it functioned but they said I Red Raiders reached out to me etc Placement is going to be more and more a priority, and that's going to be an expectation of those who invest in this institution as to what's the future and what's my percentage of, in, of achieving my future at this place. And so 
whatever we can do to enhance the placement opportunities and coordinate as, as Cody and Ginger have discussed is going to be imperative. Let me ask you about, I'm intrigued on this student engagement. Is it, is it limited to just on-campus activities? I mean, why did I hear a rumor that Chimmies was setting up a study hall and then wanted to be a part of that program? You have a different information base than I do. I don't know about their study hall over there. <laughs> Uh, so I think the student engagement platform, and I'm, I'm, I'm speaking at a very high level here, but we know when um, we have a platform now that faculty can go in and identify students that are at risk. And then we have a different platform that the Dean of Students identifies students at risk for mental health and wellness or other issues and it's not in the same platform. So that's what I was talking about in, in, by putting it all in the same platform. Both parties know that while this student may be doing um, really well in grades, something else may have occurred and now the faculty or the advisor knows that. Or something else comes up on the student affairs side and they can see is this also impacting elsewhere in their in their student curriculum or career. And I think I would just say also that we need to be very sensitive to privacy concerns there and, and from that standpoint, mm -hmm. if, if I'm hearing Absolutely. and understanding how you're describing the, the process. Any other questions? I would entertain a motion to approve the item as presented. So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Very good presentation. <clears throat> Dr. Rice Spearman, please present item four. We come forward today seeking um, permission to execute a contract extension with the Laura W. Bush Institute. We established this institute in 2012 with Laura W. Bush. This institute has three uh, primary focuses. The first one is research. The institute has invested $3.25 million in seed grant funding for sex and gender research, which has led to <coughs> NIH federal funding in the area of education. We have a scientific panel that has developed sex and gender, sex and gender education. It is now being utilized in 140 medical schools and in, in 14 countries. And also in the outreach area, we have established the Laura W. Bush Institute in six communities, Amarillo, San Angelo, Permian Basin, Dallas, Lubbock, and Corpus Christi. Mrs. Bush continues to be actively involved in this institute. She attends all of our national board meetings and she hosts events at the Bush Library to support this initiative. So we are seeking approval for extension. Questions? Mr. Chairman, if, if I may make a comment about that as well. When the Laura Bush Institute was started, when you talk about uh, the <coughs> sex and gender differences between men and women, uh, you're talking about things, you know, if you look at, if you go back historically and look at, at studies on heart disease, the vast majority were done in men. And so when you look at things related to the symptoms that people would develop, the symptoms that men develop with heart disease, in fact, are oftentimes quite different than what a woman would develop with heart disease. So the institute was developed to specifically start looking and educating the educators and educating healthcare providers on differences in the way men and women present with certain types of illnesses. People tend to think of heart disease as a male illness, but it's a female illness as well. People tend to think of osteoporosis as a female illness. It's a male illness as well. Men just tend to get it about a decade later. So that, that's the focus on this. And, and to Dr. Rice Spearman's point, this institute has been remarkably successful, in part due to the uh, former uh, First Lady's name, in being able to put together national groups on how this is instructed at medical schools literally from coast to coast. So that's what they're referring to when they talk about that. Any, any other comments or questions? Hearing none, um, could we have a motion to uh, approve this presentation? So moved. Second. All in favor? 
Aye. 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 Motion passes. Um, let's see. Dr. Lane, please present item five. Yes, sir. Thank you, Regent Walker. Uh, I'm asking your authorization uh, to approve an anesthesiology services agreement between Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center in El Paso and El Paso County Hospital District, primarily through University Medical Center. This would be a three-year contract worth approximately $21 million. And let, let me tell you why this is important, because between the time I first interviewed for this job and my second interview eight years ago, eight and a half years ago, the hospital dissolved the anesthesia contract with our university, which uh, essentially shut down the adult anesthesia program and the residency training as well, primarily because of an acrimonious relationship between the medical school and the hospital district. We've worked very hard for the last eight years to repair that. We have a terrific CEO that understands the mission, the quality that we bring, and he approached me and said, we're ready to give anesthesia back to Texas Tech University Health Science Center. When we do this, this will be the only residency program west of I-35. There's not another one in any of West Texas. So uh, this is the initial uh, move to do that. So I'd ask for your authorization to allow us to reestablish our anesthesia program at the University Medical Center. I'd like to add to that that I think this is very important for the uh, relationship between Tech and, and UMC and, and it's good for El Paso in general to have this program. And I'm glad you got it back. So I think that's important. Thank you, and I know this is a public forum, so I, I would want to give kudos to Jacob Centrone, the CEO of University Medical Center, who's played a pivotal role, uh, not only in this, but also in, in growing the medical school uh, jointly and meeting the community needs. He's been a fantastic partner. Any other questions or comments? Any staffing adjustments, Dr. Lang? Uh, we will, uh, it's interesting, the anesthesiologists that are there are working through a company that's actually out of New York. They're, they want to be on my faculty. And so we're able to take uh, essentially 90% of the people there that say, gosh, we're excited to be a part of Texas Tech. Great. Great. Is there a motion to approve this item as presented? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion passes. Mrs. Harkey and Mrs. Turner, please present item six. This is a presentation to discuss the enterprise risk management program that we have here at Texas Tech uh, University System. And, and as you think about this and as you listen to this particular presentation, I'd like for you to think about a couple of things that have already been said during uh, the board meeting today that address from an enterprise level an enterprise meaning the Texas Tech University system and things that have, are in existence that help to mitigate some of those risks. Kim talked about the hotline and, the, and about fraud and the proactive stances happened there. Dr. Mitchell mentioned Martha Brown and I can tell you that every CFO sitting on this row right now will tell you that Martha Brown is a significant helps us to navigate that by analyzing the legislation because there's so many things that come out of that that are related to compliance and keep us in line in that particular area. So as you think about that, think about it at that enterprise level. First, enterprise risk management, it is a comprehensive program and it is more of a formalized process that we go through to identify and proactively manage those risks. We use the tool to then look at how do we allocate resources, how do we manage that risk. Kim uses it for her audit planning that she'll discuss later. It also um, helps us to look at communication and um, the operational programs that we have. So, I mean, it, it is overall, and it happens every day. It happens within each of our institution, but this is more of that formalized process that we're gonna talk about today. We introduced this in 2016. Kim was very instrumental in this particular process. There's a system regulation that's been defined. There's templates that we all complete. There's a, there's a deadline with the ultimate being that we report to the board what the enterprise risks are at May of each particular year. And then there's follow-up that goes on continually to mitigate those risks. 
And what you're going to see today is not all the risks that are within the institutions, but more about the top risks that have floated to the top. And there are obviously common ones that are across all of our institutions, and that's what we'll talk about. Kim's going to talk about more of the process, and then I'll go back in and talk more specifics. Thank you, Penny. The key elements of a, an enterprise risk management framework the first step is identifying and prioritizing risks. And we'll talk in a minute about the various types of risks that we look at at the Texas Tech University system. As risks are identified and prioritized, we need to determine the level of acceptable risk. It's not possible to eliminate all risk. Um, a lot of great new opportunities bring risk with them, and so we want to consider what does that mean and what is the level of risk that we're willing to accept, the management, that management and the board are willing to accept. Mitigation activities then are implemented to either reduce the risk of occurring or reduce the impact of a risk where we can't have an, uh, where we can't, uh, have an impact on whether it happens or not. Big tornado is an example. We have no control over that, but we can prepare for it. Then we conduct ongoing monitoring. So we're looking at what are, what are we, uh, controls are we applying to try to address the risk or the impact, and are they working, and do we need to tweak those? And then periodic reporting comes out of that at various levels, but it does flow up to senior management and the board. This is another way to look at that process. It is, it does, it is conducive to thinking about it in a, as a circular process. Assessment of risk is not just once every year, once every two years, once every quarter. It really happens continuously. As I'm talking about risk with various individuals that I meet with to prepare the annual audit plan each year, I tell them, if you're managing people or resources, you're managing risk. You may not think of it in those terms. We identify the specific risk concerns and the point of enterprise risk management is that we're not just limiting ourselves to a silo. We're not just you know, one college assessing its risk. We look at it at an enterprise level because many risks imp uh, impact multiple areas and need multiple areas involved in solving those uh, preparation issues. We assess internal and external factors that may play into the risks facing our institutions. Then the mitigation process I described, some risks we can outsource through insurance, some risks that uh, we um, can have an impact on whether the risk actually happens and others we're preparing for what if something does happen that we have no control over. Then we monitor our processes, look for continuous improvement. We use this information in funding priorities, resource allocation, and in our audit plan, and then through the audit process, we're often looking at the risk mitigation strategies, which you might call internal controls. As we implemented the framework for this, and we, what we implemented was a framework, which then each university went out and, and started, implemented ERM in its own way, because our universities are not one size fits all. We, we contemplated several types of risk categories. Financial risk, which includes things like resources. Enrollment, which of course impacts our, fu our funding. Inflation, which is very uh, timely to think about right now. The structure of our finances. How are we gonna be able to meet our future needs as we've talked about with multiple uh, large projects this morning? We talk about operational risk. This is our continuity of activities, safety and security, our physical infrastructure. Um, efficiency and effectiveness concerns, and then recruitment and retention, which are really key right now given the uh, employment environment, also play into this. IT risks, strategy and operations, we want data security, privacy, control over our data, cybersecurity, upgrades and in infrastructure, which are constant. You talk, Noel talked about um, in the new uh, classrooms and academic spaces, they've committed, we're gonna replace the technology every four years to keep it current. And then on the compliance side of the house, we have legal and regulatory compliance at the state and federal level. We have compliance within contract, 
requirements that we need to be in compliance with. We have accreditation standards at the institution level as well as individual programs, colleges, and schools. NCAA compliance is big at our, um, especially at Texas Tech University, it's an inherent risk, as well as Angelo State, Midwestern State, and then privacy. Then we talk about strategic risk. This is our big picture, where are we going? What is our organizational reputation? We talk about reputational risk. Reputational risk usually stems from not managing some other kind of risk effectively. Constituent relationships play into this and whether you're talking about fundraising or alumni relations or um, the ability for our students to get jobs after graduation. Our ability to generate funds and to support the strategic priorities that our institutions have set. And just a quick, you don't want to read all this, but this is to show you the level that we went to as we were developing the framework. We wanted to give a commonality to the language and common information so that as, as risks came forward from our various institutions, we could see that what is, a mi what is considered a minor risk across these categories? What would be considered a moderate or a major or a severe risk? So we wanted to give some definition around that so it wasn't just sort of gut feel of the people that were working on this. All right, Penny's gonna talk about more specifics. This is a, a bar chart that just shows you graphically the top of the top 10 risks at each institution that have been reported, the categories that they fall in. And so you see that, that blend there. Some are more operational, some are more IT related, uh, and each of that is just how each individual institution evaluated the various risks within their, uh, within their campus and, and within their administration and within their structure. Now this, I wanna talk, in terms, you'll see two different slides. This particular slide, as Kim mentioned, we have the major risk, moderate risk, whether it's severe. Uh, we used a little bit different color scheme on this. This is if we had no mitigation strategies at all. If we just said there's nothing we can do about it, we're doing nothing, and that's what Kim mentioned as inherent risk. Um, and so this tells you exactly what, how everybody <coughs> is assessing their particular risk. And again, this is the top 10 risk. Please, it's, it's, it's important for us to, to, uh, to look at it in a perspective of some of this is comparative. Is this minor for my institution versus major and how do each risk compare to each other? Sometimes we think about it in those terms. So um, that is without any mitigation strategies. Then the, you'll see the change because this is what we focus on. With the mitigation strategies that are in place, um, there are, you see the reduction in the levels of risks at each of the institutions. So this is the work that we do on a continual basis to look at it and to try to mitigate those risks, identify those risks, using all the tools that Kim outlined also. Is it a typo with the ASU icon or are we really not reducing any risk with our mitigation strategies at ASU? It's, it's consistent 80 Seven percent and thirteen and eighty-seven percent and thirteen. Well, I would say it, I don't know if it's a typo or not. I'll get back to you on that whether that's a typo or not. Um, it should be a typo. It should be know. a typo. It's exactly right. There. Some might say <laughs> better be a typo. <laughs> so I, I'll look into so, that and and get back so to. So the you. NASA nerd in me is coming out. How how often do you have risk reviews at each one of the universities and at the system level? So as far as risk reviews, that's Kim talked about that. Kim does that on an annual basis, and I'll let Kim talk about that. Mm -hmm. I think risk reviews are specific by university. I don't know what all of those internal processes look like. Um, at when, when ERM was first implemented, um, Texas Tech University and TTUHSC um, took a little bit more of a structured approach um, that involved gathering more information. Angelo State University and HSC El Paso, which at the time were both smaller, took a little bit more of a nimble approach where their senior leaders were more involved and I think the strategy might not have funneled down quite as far through the organization because it's a little bit flatter of an organization. Um, so I think that 
management at every level, whether you're talking about administrative departments, whether you're talking about deans of colleges and schools, um, and then senior leaders, they're constantly assessing and addressing risk and taking steps to mitigate those um, strategies. I don't know how frequently they're coming back to the table in their executive leadership teams and really talking about that. And I would say that uh, Regent Carrick, it also varies depending on the area of the risk that you're looking at. So when it comes to certain areas under compliance and finance and the like, there is a, a concerted effort annually looking at things with that. If you look at other things related to some of the infrastructure and facilities, it could be very different. So for example, the Health Sciences Center, I think we did this twice over the decade while I was over there, where you would literally have a disaster scenario going in place. Well, that's, that's not something you would do every single year with that, but things related to potential areas and financial areas and the like, you're doing that much more often. So it also <coughs> depends on the particular area mm -hmm. of the ERM that you're looking at. And I would say information technology, uh, this is their bailiwick. They live in an area of risk and it's constantly changing. So they have the most well-developed and deep processes for managing risk. Where I was going with that is um, I, I have always been a proponent almost every meeting that we have, I talk about collaboration across universities. And so, you know, if, if you have, if you are constantly assessing risk for information technology, for example, you're gonna be coming up with things that scare you, that you find in your university that you need to mitigate. It may not scare you as much as if, if you made a phone call to a sister university and realized that they had already figured out a mitigation strategy for that. And so by, if, by establishing a regular cadence of when you review the risk, you can also establish a regular cadence of integration and, and collaboration across the universities in the system to help re collectively reduce risk. Because, you know, why be part of a system if we're not taking advantage of some of the opportunities? So, great. Thank you. Can I ask an elementary question? What's the definition here, and how much of it is objective criteria that you use in assessing versus subjective? As far as ranking these between the minor yeah, moderate yes ma'am um, some of it is very I would say it's subjective because we live in that world every day to it's hard honestly to think if we had no mitigation strategies because we live in a world of mitigation strategies to so to say we have no mitigation strategies whatsoever mm -hmm. so I think that's part of it so it is subjective I think that's why you can't necessarily compare across the institutions necessarily because every institution uh, thinks of those just a little bit differently as we're ranking those. And does it, I, I would find it interesting to, to compare rankings across different parts of the academy. Yes. yes. From management to at the academy to mm -hmm. operations and how they would assess a similar type opportunity and how they would gauge or grade that. And then, so, are those just combined together and they take the average to get to that or, or do different cat do different parts and subsets of the university have their own mitigation plans? Each area does have their own mitigation plans, but this is, and this is why this one's at the enterprise level, because what's interesting, at least from coming from a component institution perspective, is we go out and ask for, from every college, every campus, what are your top risks? So that's the way we handle that. And, and then you see, because sometimes you do hear of things that you, you it, common themes float to the top, let's put it that way. And then you evaluate it to say, okay, what is the level of risk? We also know, obviously, that things that are happen at the, within the world and within the community, all of those things change the perception of what the risk is. Uh, safety and security pre-pandemic pre was a very, during all the school shootings and things, was a very different conversation to safety during pandemic and post-pandemic. So a lot of that changes just from the perspective of the lives that people are le leading on a daily basis. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Okay, hearing none, <clears throat> we, we don't have to approve that report, but it was an excellent report. <clears throat> Are you now we'll move to, uh, Ms. Harkey, Ms. Turner, we'll move to item seven, the uh, investment performance of our endowment. 
So um, first I want to say that I'm going to give a high level preview and overview of the investment performance, but I do have the subject matter experts here, uh, Tim Barrett and Tim Bruce, who have presented to you uh, before they were both in uh, El Paso with us, and so they'll be able to answer any specific detailed questions. So this is the uh, ending year, December 31st, of our long-term investment fund, keeping in mind that we have two that we're going to evaluate the long-term investment fund and the consolidated cash pool. There was a one-year return for the calendar year of 20.53%, and as you can see, that outperformed the benchmark at 9.86%. Um, the split out of the por portfolio between the growth component and the stable value component, you can see that the majority of uh, that was attributed to the growth component of, of the portfolio. Now February looks a little different. Um, quarter to date, there has been a negative return of 2.93%, but keeping in mind compared to the benchmark, it is still better than the benchmark. We all know that the environment that we're in as far as the investments are concerned. The trailing one year is still solid at almost 16% compared to the benchmark at 3.51%. This is a breakdown of the long-term fund by the types of investments. It's just a recap of the same information, but to tell you the specific returns that, that are available or that were a result of all the details there. February 28th is the most complete data that we have at this point, and uh, so that's the, the month that we are reporting on. This is the chart that you see, um, I think, every time that Gary, and by the way, he sent us pictures. He's out fishing with, a, with, a, with some T-shirts on that talks about being retired and uh, that sort of thing and sent that to us right before the meeting. But uh, the yellow line there is the CPI plus 5%, and you can see that even in the downturn that we're beginning to see, that uh, the LTIF, which is, is the red line there, those returns are still higher than the CPI plus 5%. Before we go any further, I wanted to see if there was any questions on the long-term fund before we go into the comprehensive cash pool. Uh, <clears throat> yes, I think uh, having both Tim and Tim here, um, uh, we're obviously moving into a more difficult uh, situation worldwide in terms of the markets and performance is more difficult to achieve. And I'd like to ask uh, Tim and Tim if they wouldn't mind uh, addressing the, the markets uh, and how they see them for the balance of the year. Thank you, Penny, and thank you, Regent. So I'm going to touch briefly on the conditions, and then I'm going to turn to Tim to talk specifically about the portfolio and how it's set up. Um, so not to always start in, with negative news, but I think it's probably the most uh, realistic thing given the current market. If you think about where we did, what we did with this portfolio two years ago, the goal was very specific, and that is it had two specific objectives. One, to be closer in line with the broad benchmarks, right? So we could understand that we're relative to the benchmark. And so we did that. We reoriented the portfolio to be closer to that. The second goal was to make sure that that line that Penny just showed you could stay that way. What does that mean? It means that we're not building a portfolio that is trying to swing for the fences that's going to be top of Nakubo one year, bottom of Nakubo the next year, 50% up one year, 2% down the next year. We're not running the portfolio that way. There's a case to run portfolios that way, but that's not what we're doing here given the objectives. So with that design, we've set up a portfolio that should weather environments like that. Okay, so that's the background. The negative news is that the markets have been brutal. I mean, the past four months has been really tough. Um, 
that first objective I told you of being closer to the benchmark, we're going to experience some of that correction. We have a 30% plus allocation to equities, and so we got hit there in that market. Um, we have a fixed income orientation there that's also gotten beat up. You know, just in first principles, remember, usually when one thing does well, equities does well, usually fixed income preserves you. That hasn't really played out so far this year. What's the good news? The good news is that the markets aren't giving us a lot of great information, but given the objective of still being close to that benchmark and weathering so we have that nice steady growth in line, we've done that. I, I think it's really important to note that when the markets are down meaningfully like they are now, you should look at those numbers and say we should be down less. We are down less, meaningfully down less. So in our mind, markets are tough, markets are choppy. I don't have a lot of hope, given the current inflationary environment, that that's going to change, despite what happened yesterday in the markets. And so we built a portfolio that should weather that, okay? And so in, in my mind, that should be the question you're asking us month to month, quarter to quarter. If I may, before I turn to Tim, I think one other really important thing for everyone here to think about is that there is no compensation without risk. And so the risk we have here that you all should be conscious of is that first piece. We still have some benchmark sensitivity, and that is when those markets perform, we're not going to be immune from it. And then second off, you'll see in that stable value piece, we've weathered that storm and done well because we've traded off a little bit of credit risk for rate risk. That's working swimmingly right now, but that's a risk that we have sitting in the portfolio. And I always like to just reflect that when things are going great for us because it doesn't always work that way. So with that, I want to pause and turn to Tim to talk about the portfolio more specifically. Sure, thanks, Tim. Um, I'm going to go back just a slide and, and talk to you just a little bit about positioning because what Tim told you was that we're seeing a lot of rate risk, right? And where you see rate risk is in the line underneath stable value where it says Bloomberg Global Aggregate. So if you go across that line item, you can see the trailing year that's down, my eyes aren't that great, uh, 532. So that's a negative 5% return. Almost 100% of that is just due to the rising rate environment. You couple that with inflation and we're pushing that higher and higher. The way we've structured this portfolio is there's a substantial portion of what we call absolute return, which are hedge funds that should do okay regardless of the rate environment. And then there's public and private credit. Most of that credit is what we call floating rate credit. That means it resets as rates go higher, it resets on a lag basis, so you don't get hurt as much. If you owned a nominal bond and rates are going up, you're going to be very unhappy. You're going to lose a lot of money. And that's what's really happening in the government bond market. And that's really how we're outperforming on the stable value side. The other thing I'd like to add is our long-term internal target for public equities is 40%. 20% for private equity. So in aggregate, that's that 60% of the 60-40, right? One way that we're trying to beat the public markets is with that 20% in private equity. We have things like early stage venture capital in there. We have growth equity strategies, which invest in companies with increasing revenues. And we have buyout strategies, secondary strategies, even oil and gas. All of those things are broadly diversified, and if you looked at them over any kind of rolling three-year period, they beat the ACWI benchmark. Could we lose in a, in a quarter or two? Absolutely. But over a longer period, we win almost every time, statistically speaking. The last thing I'd point to on how we're kind of attacking this market, if you will, is in the public equity space. I mentioned to you that we had 40% target to public equities. If you look up at the chart and look at where it says LTIF public equity, you don't see 40%. You see 32. We're 8% underweight equities, public equities, and have been since the end of last year. Why? Because they aren't attractive. Everybody knew they were going to raise rates. You knew that was going to create volatility. We took our foot off the gas. At some point, and this is the hard part, everybody can take your foot off the gas, you also got to know when to put it back on. I can't tell you when that is yet, it's not now. So we're staying with our current positioning. The last piece, which is a little more nuanced, is, and you can't really see it here because we don't give you the detail at the next level, but that 20% uh, 
or that percent that's in active equity managers. We dramatically overweighted <laughs> last November one of the managers in there that's a much more balanced manager between growth and value, and we underweighted our growth managers last November. That hurt us a little bit in December because we were early, right? Because growth went through the roof in December. But fast forward to the first quarter, that's been a home run for us. And that manager has more than doubled the performance of the other underlying managers in that category. So I would say it's incrementalism. It's small changes around the edges. You don't ever want to swing for the fences. But we believe that we've positioned the portfolio well to win and within what the regents wanted within that global 60-40 mandate. Happy to answer uh, any other questions. So, Tim, in a synopsis, then, the performance on the LTIF, the credit side, is performed primarily because of floating rate, it, it tied to floating rate primarily. Is that it, what you said? Yeah, I, I would say that if you looked at the private debt, which is approximately 173 million or 10.64%, mm -hmm. the vast majority of that is floating rate debt. Right, so that's, that's why. It, and when you go to the public debt, that's a mix of floating rate debt strategies and hedge fund credit yep. strategies. So I, a little clarifying question here. <clears throat> so the public, public securities that we own, they're reported here, are marked as of February. Pardon me? The public ones? The are public there. ones are marked as of February. Yes, sir. The privates are marked as of when? That would be, most of them would be marked as of December. So we don't see yet the performance over the last three months in the, in the privates. So we don't really know how the private investments have performed during the most recent downturn in the last three months. Have you in the last here? two months now. Okay. Uh, we have updates from our managers because they can tell us how the portfolios are going versus broad indices that they invest in. So you can see floating rate indices, right? But that's not reported here. That's not reported here, but so, I can tell you it's down slightly on floating so rate. So our outperformance though, just looking at these numbers, is largely due to the performance of our private investments which are actually marked as of December. Uh, it, ha it has a major impact for sure. So we don't really know yet exactly how we've done in this downturn. I just wanted to make that clarification. Yeah, I would, I, would, I would say that's accurate. But I mean, even if you looked at public equity or public debt, which are marked, you can see the outperformance in those areas versus the bar cap or the acqui. You are correct and the privates are reported on a lag basis at the end of every quarter, it usually takes about 45 days at quarter end to get those numbers. So March numbers are just starting to come in. And so far, they've been pretty positive. Yeah. Tim, does on the LTIF private equity then, 43.8%, 1231, I guess. But nevertheless, how would you characterize it as far as a non-correlated energy-based return? In other words, the one segment of the market that has performed is energy. And, yeah. almost any kind of form. So do we still have a pretty decent energy exposure? Um, I would say that, that that's, that's been winding down over time. Mm -hmm. It's um, the private diversifying uh, strategy that's listed up there of 60, 65 million, um, about 4%. The vast majority of that is uh, oil and gas type strategies. Right. And it's done uh, quite well. You can see that over the last year, that's up about 37 percent. Yeah, so obviously the first three months, four months of this year, oil and gas has continued to perform. I think that piece has done well. I think, I think, I think longer term loans, are, loans will, will lag and bounce around the bar cap. I think you're going to see a little bit of downturn there just because of selling pressure. Mm -hmm. um, the private equity, I think, will continue to do well as well as oil and gas. Mm -hmm. Tim, what role, and I know it's short-term likely, what role do you see cash playing now in this hmm. environment? That's a great question. Um, I think for, from my standpoint, we're probably getting close to, to the maximum cash levels for us. Um, and that is because we're benchmarked to the global 60, 40 plus 100 basis points. So anytime you take a deviation too far away from that, you put what they call tracking error, meaning that I could come back next quarter and look really bad in front of you guys because the equity market's ripped and I'm, I'm too underweight. Um, at 32% is probably about as low as we'll go in public equities. 
And in fact, I'd argue over the next few months, we'll probably start adding back into that if, if you start to see rate stabilization. Um, cash at, at where we are now, you can see the LTIF cash at 3.2 and cash collateral net, which just is additional cash at 2.8. So you're over five. That's probably getting pretty close to the max we'll be. We'll use that money to rebalance back into markets. Seems like volatility is just phenomenal. <laughs> I mean, it's just... You know, it's been every two years, right? So you go back to Q4 2018, the taper tantrum, massive sell-off. Q1 20, 30% sell-off. Now we're in 22, it's Groundhog Day. Um, it just keeps continuing. Um, I'd love to tell you that sunny skies are coming right away, but I think it's a way, it might be a ways off. Any other questions or comments? <clears throat> okay. Um, um, I think Ms. Harkey and Turner, you had one other, um, I think it was on the intermediate fund that you wanted to present. Yes, we do have the consolidated cash pool presentation portion of this, keeping in mind that the consolidated cash pool is actually our operating cash. And that is divided into three segments. Um, you can see there we have the cash component of it, the contingency segment, and then the non-current segment, which is in transition between being invested in what is considered the ITF legacy and the non-current uh, segment only. This is as of December 31st, and again, it's the same scenario that you can see that it did outperform the comprehensive cash pool as, a, as in, a, in total outperformed uh, the benchmark significantly. And then we do have uh, the February 28th data, um, every, even though just like the long-term fund, when you consider it at the total level, the fiscal year to date is down 1.4% uh, uh, compared to a negative return of 3.9% for the specific benchmark. So, one quick question: As a, the ITF legacy for Tim Barrett, the uh, that obviously produced a nice return. But that aside, is our um, burn off of that just kind of the normal course of events. We're not into the secondary market trying to liquidate it or any of that. It's just taking its normal course. It's, it's the normal course. We're absolutely not going to the secondary market. If you yeah. go to the secondary market, as you know, you're going to give you're going to pay 10 to 20% to get that liquidity. Right. So the burn, uh, rate, it's just a regular burn off, regular burn off. Okay. It's going to stay there a while then. Well, some of them were private credit funds, so those are you know seven to ten year funds. So those are winding down, but the right. vast majority of it in the next three four years will be out. Okay, but it's serving us well currently. It's it's doing incredibly well right now. Right. Good. <clears throat> well, I think we do, we're uh, uh, we're doing well in in both. Um, I'd like to ask Ms. Harkey if you could set up a meeting next week with uh, Vice Chairman Campbell and myself to talk about the intermediate fund. Um, I'd like to see how that's doing also. Yes, sir, we will. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that uh, that, that concludes, and sorry that, that we've gone so long on this overall committee presentation, but, but thank you uh, uh, both for the presentations. Mr. Chairman, this concludes the meeting of the Finance and Investments Committee. All right. Thank you, Regent Walker. Our final committee meeting today is the Academic, Clinical, and Student Affairs Committee. Regent Carrick Davis serves as the chair, and Regent Gordon serves as the vice chair of that committee. Regent Carrick Davis, please continue with the ACS committee meeting. All right. Thank you, Chairman Lewis. The Academic, Clinical, and Student Affairs Committee is called to order. I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the meeting held on February 24th, 2022. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Right. Aye. Motion, motion passes. All right, Dr. Topliff, please begin with item number one. Thank you, Regent Carrick Davis. 
Uh, item number one is, is to request approval of the addition of a Bachelor of Science degree with a major in cybersecurity. The President recommends the Chancellor concurs that the Board of Regents approve the new degree repro program request for a Bachelor of Science degree with a major in cybersecurity in the Department of C Computer Science within the College of Science and Engineering and authorize submission to the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board for approval and to SACS for its review. Implementation of the new program would begin in this fall of 2022. Obviously, there's a high demand for cybersecurity professionals, both in industry and government. It's been uh, reported that there are 3 million cybersecurity positions currently open in the United States, and growth in cybersecurity is projected at 33% year over year. In 2020, Angelo State submitted a grant proposal to NSA for a cybersecurity capacity building grant with the aim of becoming a cybersecurity center of excellence. The grant provided funding for some upgrades, a faculty line, and also academic programs in cybersecurity. The proposed Bachelor of Science in Cybersecurity is one of the academic programs that were identified in the grant. The Department of Computer Science has leveraged their current course offerings with a few new course offerings uh, to establish the proposed Bachelor of Science program. New faculty member is currently being hired. And in addition, the degree students will have multiple uh, paid grant opportunities and the ability to achieve security clearances at the top and even potentially the top secret level. Table one shows the number of students in, uh, projected over five years. That may look kind of high, but I will tell you that we just received a major grant from the Department of Informational Resources to establish a regional security operations center on our campus. As a part of that grant, we will be employing 30 students per year to monitor that regional security operations center. So the opportunities for students is going to be tremendous, and we believe that this uh, program will meet these enrollment projections. Table two shows the five-year costs uh, and funding sources, and you can see there that we project just over a million dollars in costs, and then the anticipated funding uh, for the first five years of the program totals $4.2 million. We believe this will be an outstanding addition to our current uh, program offerings and ask for its approval. All right, and Dr. Topliff, before we go around the room for any questions, I just want to commend you for including in the program the um, real world experiences for the students so that they're not just studying the theory of cybersecurity but have an opportunity to work in a security operations center is going to be going to be huge and getting that security clearance as well. So thank you. So any other questions or comments? Chair Carrick Davis, he mentioned this, Topliff mentioned this. It cannot be overstated how important this is for our system. And he mentioned the funding, the additional funding that is coming in from the state that is several million dollars for this. This is a real jewel for us. And given the world that we're operating in now globally, uh, this, is, uh, this is a real asset for our system to have this type of academic program and research program available to our system. Kudos. Any other questions or comments? Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Right. Motion passes. Dr. Topliff, item number two, please. Item two, we're asking for the approval of addition of a Master of Science degree within a major in the business data science and analytics. Uh, the president recommends and the chancellor concurs that the Board of Regents approve the new degree program request for a Master of Science degree with a major in business data science and analytics within the Norris Vincent College of Business and authorize notification to the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board for their approval and to the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools for their review. Implementation of this program is projected to begin in the fall of 2022. Obviously, business data science and analytics is an important area that combines the skills of those students in the College of Business and those in computer science. And, and leveraging those two and combining those into a single program will prepare graduates to fill the ever-widening gap between analytic needs 
and the supply of analytics professionals. Obviously, this is a program that is contained in other universities, but as Silicon Valley companies flee the high taxes and move to Texas, which they're doing in droves, the need for analytics uh, professionals will continue to grow. Our proposal integrates the existing graduate courses from the Norris Vincent College of Business and the Computer Science uh, Department, which in 2021 launched a Master of Science in Computer Science. For both of these existing graduate programs, courses are delivered in a 100% online eight-week format, which we think is really key to, to making this program go. Table one shows the five-year projected enrollment in the program, and again, the numbers there are not large per year, as this is a master's program that is going to be difficult. When you combine both business and computer science, this will not be a program for the weak at heart. So the, uh, the thing on five-year costs and funding sources, you can see that we're not really adding any new faculty. We're leveraging the existing faculty and coursework uh, in, in, the, in the two colleges uh, to, to make this program go. And then the anticipated funding for the first five years is about a million point six. So again, we think this is a program that will have a lot of traction and be very important not only to ASU, but to the state of Texas as well. All right, any questions or comments? Regent Kirk Davis, I would also add that this will um, tie into that regional security operations center and the artificial intelligence side of what we're going to be doing with that as well. Yeah, it is a very good match of skills, mix of skills. And, and by the way, I mentioned I was hiring, I'm hiring data analysts, so have them call me as soon as you're done. Um, any other questions or comments? I will make sure that, that you get some resumes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, the motion passes. Um, Dr. Camacho, please present item number three. Just thank you, Regent. Um, the President recommends and the Chancellor concurs that the Board of Regents approve changes to the academy rank effective September 1st, 2022 for the faculty listed in item number three. All right, any questions or comments? Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 The motion passes. Uh, Dr. Camacho, item number four, please. Thank you. The president recommends and the chancellor, chancellor concurs that the Board of Regents approve changes in academic rank and the granting of tenure effective September 1st, 2022 for the faculty listed in item number four. Any questions or comments? Is there a motion to approve? So moved. So moved. All Second. Those, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Thank you very much. Um, you. Dr. Hendrick, you're next with item number five. Thank you. The President recommends and Chancellor concurs that the Board of Regents approve granting of tenure for four faculty at Texas Tech University. Um, the first is uh, well known to us, Dr. Martin Camacho, DMA, um, has been appointed the new Dean of our JT and Margaret Talkington College of Visual and Performing Arts, uh, and will begin that position July 1st of this year. Um, he is a tenured professor uh, at Midwestern State, obviously still or currently serving as as interim provost and previously as dean. Uh, Dr. Tasha Dupras is beginning June 1 as our dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. She is currently the senior associate dean um, at the University of Central Florida in the College of Arts and Sciences there and um, uh, is a uh, decorated faculty member. Third is Dr. Uh, or Jeffrey Korn, JD, is going to be appointed the George R. Killiam Chair of Professor and uh, Professor of Criminal Law in the School of Law. Uh, he has his JD from George Washington University, a 21-year career in the military. And then our final candidate is uh, Dr. Devendra Shah. He is joining the School of Veterinary Medicine, uh, joined effective March 1st, most, most recently faculty member at University of Washington and their School of Veterinary Medicine. 
Uh, all four of these individuals bring excellence in teaching, research, service, and administration to Texas Tech. Upon approval of these faculty members, the number of full-time tenured faculty members uh, at Texas Tech will be 813, with a total of 1,121 full-time tenure and tenure-track faculty, 72% of, 0.5% uh, of those are tenured, and our tenured faculty represent 40.1% of all faculty at Texas Tech. Thank you, Dr. Hendrick. Any questions or comments? Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. All right, Dr. Hendrick, item number six, please. Thank you. The President recommends and the Chancellor concurs that the Board of Regents approve a new degree program, the Bachelor of Arts in Criminology, and authorize submission by the Office of Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs to the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board to seek certification of the program and of the Southern Association of College and Schools for acknowledgement of the new degree program. There are 26 Texas colleges and universities that offer degrees in criminal justice. Um, we have been able to find none that offer programs in criminology. Criminal justice tends to be a more vocationally oriented degree. And while graduates in criminology can certainly, and, and uh, we anticipate, will pursue um, careers in criminal justice, uh, it is founded more in sociological thought, um, more analytical in understanding the role that society plays in preventing and contributing to criminal behavior. We anticipate at the end of five years to have approximately 250 students graduating 60 plus students a year at the end of that time frame. We currently offer a concentration in our sociology uh, degree of criminology, so no new faculty are required and we anticipate uh, net revenues of about 2.5 million um, with, at the end of the first five years. I appreciate the, the ex extra explanation. When I first read this, I thought, what, what's the difference? And it was a very good write-up to understand the difference, and I see the different types of job opportunities that it could, that could, it op it could open up. So thank you very much, Dr. Hendrick. Any questions or comments? All right, motion to approve? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Dr. Lang, you're up next. Thank you, Regent Gert. Uh, we're asking that you uh, approve changes to operating policy 77.05, which is student leaves of absence and suspensions. It was formerly suspension and retention. I normally don't bring these before the board, but the changes are fairly extensive, and I just want to make you aware of what they are. Uh, we didn't uh, specifically identify when students may just have a leave of absence, not a suspension. So we wanted to define when that might occur, either voluntarily or involuntarily. Uh, and how that differs from uh, suspension. Talk about the processes from the Registrar of Student Financial Aid, Student Services, about how those things are properly processed, when a student may be summarily suspended, and then finally, what is our role as an institution for communicating all of these clearly to the student. So you see extensive changes, mostly just for clarification and to uh, shore up. There were a couple um, different operating policies that appeared to be uh, conflict, conflicting in terms of how they delayed this out. So this is an attempt to clarify those. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Lang. Any questions or comments? Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 The motion Aye. passes. All right, Mr. Chairman, um, this concludes the meeting of the Academic, Clinical, and Student Affairs Committee. Thank you, everyone. That concludes the business to be handled by our committees. The meeting of the Board of Regents of Texas Tech University System is now called to order. The board, will, the board will continue in open session and meet as a committee of the whole and meeting of the board. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the board meetings held on February 24th, 2022 and March 7th, 2022? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion passes. We will now consider items as the committee of the whole, and I would like to ask Vice Chairman Griffin to preside over the committee of the whole. Mr. Griffin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The item for consideration for the committee of the whole is consideration of the consent agenda, items A through S, as listed on pages 1 through 48 of the agenda book, and the information agenda as listed on pages 49 through 56. Please note that item K 
5.3 regarding approval of the TTU five-year capital projects plan and submission of the MP1 report was revised. The update to TTU's capital projects plan was discussed earlier today by Mr. Breedlove during the facilities committee meeting. Is there any discussion of the items in either the consent or the information agenda? As a reminder, if there is an item that you would like discussed in further detail or voted on separately from the consent agenda, you may request that the item be moved to the committee of the whole agenda. Hearing none then, Mr. Chairman, I move that the board approve the consent agenda as revised and acknowledge its review of the information agenda. Is there a second? Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. The motion passes. Mr. Mr. Chairman, Griffin. this concludes the items to be considered by the committee of the whole at this time. <clears throat> Thank you, Regent Griffin. Kano, please present the schedule of upcoming board meetings and the proposed 2023 meeting dates. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, the next upcoming meeting is the August uh, board meeting scheduled for August 11th and 12th. Uh, of note there is that that meeting will be held in San Angelo on the campus, on the ASU uh, campus. Uh, following that, we'll have our November 17th and 18th meeting back here in, in Lubbock. Um, regarding the proposed meeting dates for uh, 2023, there is a printout um, in front of each region of those dates that were previously uh, shared. Um, just of note there, we still uh, have adopted or proposing to adopt our four meeting schedule. I know for pretty much all the meetings, we have them scheduled as a two day meeting, but as we've done this year, depending on the agenda, uh, we will adjust uh, s certain dates as, as necessary. Um, the February board meeting date would be another uh, travel day uh, and will be at one of the TTUHSC uh, campuses uh, to be determined on exactly which one uh, for next year. So if there are no objections to the dates as proposed, going forward, these dates would be uh, used for the board website and also in the agenda book going forward. Are there any objections? Okay, duly noted, sir. Thank you. The board will now convene into executive session as authorized by sections 551071 through 074 and 076 of the Texas Government Code. Thank you.
The board will now reconvene into open session. Regent Griffin, please present the motions regarding the items discussed in executive session. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There'll be three motions to be presented to the board. Motion number one, I move that the board authorize President Lang to conclude the negotiations and execute the necessary documents for acquisition of property in El Paso as identified in executive session under the terms and conditions set forth in executive session. Is there a second? So moved. All those, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. The motion passes. Motion number two, Mr. Chairman, I move that the board authorize the following namings at Angelo State University. Number one, naming a facility. Number two, naming an area within a facility. And number three, naming an academic unit. All in accordance with the terms and conditions set forth in executive session and delegate to President Hawkins the authority to announce the namings at the appropriate time. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion passes. And Mr. Chairman, the final motion. I move that the Board of Regents authorize President Rice Spearman to conclude the negotiations and execute the necessary documents for acquisition of property in Amarillo as identified in executive session and under the terms and conditions set forth in executive session. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The motion passes. Are there any other announcements at this time? Um, Chairman, I would just like to take one more opportunity to um, thank President Johnston for everything that he has done. You were the right man at the right time to really help bring MSU into the TTU system family. And I just want to thank you for everything that you've done for the university, for the system, and how much I appreciate your love for the students. You could tell that they love you. Heck, even my mom loves you now after the dinner. <laughs> Dr. Lang used to be her favorite, but I think. <laughs> so, <laughs> so just thank you for everything that you've done. And even though we won't be seeing your, your smiling face here, we know that you'll be still doing great things for, the, for MSU and for our system. So thank you very much. Okay. Dr. Lang tried to sell her a house. <laughs> <laughs> tried to buy her house. All right. Any other items? With that, there being no further business to come before the board, do I hear a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 This meeting of the Board of Regents of the Texas Tech University System stands adjourned.